Hello, hello. Everybody, really, need, we need to get started right on time. So everyone really needs to take their seat, even even those in the wedding reception line. <laughs> Tony Fauci has been married a long time. He's not available. <laughs> this is this is I'm not. This is a wedding reception line. So so. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you for your, <laughs> thank you really for your, your. I think for Tony, this is a love fest that uh, <laughs> he's he, he's not used to this love fest. Tony, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to stop. <laughs> All right, everybody needs to take their seat and come in from outside. We, we, okay, we're gonna get started. The last, the very last gasp of uh... a... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tony, you're set? Sir? You ready? I'm good. All right. <laughs> All right, well, let me... <laughs> Talk... <laughs> I, I, I've got to say... <laughs> I got to say, on behalf of Rob and I, we're, we're great. We, we're thrilled that Tony's here. You know, it's one of the highlights of the meeting every year. As you all know, Dr. Fauci has has been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease for probably more than four decades now. I hate to say that, but it's it's about four decades because um, we met that long ago. Um, he's been obviously a terrific advocate for all infectious disease, but maybe especially HIV. He's had numerous, numerous awards and opportunities for leadership that have been done demonstrated by the affection that you all have showed him. And I'm, as I told him, I was at the VTN meeting recently, and I, I think we really outdid the affection part of, uh, of this. And so, and, and if, you, if you don't know Tony, he's probably the only one here who's got a movie. There's a movie on the Disney Channel called Fauci, which I strongly, I mean, so, it, and it's competing with Top Gun Maverick. So, so, so it's not clear to me, it's not clear to me about you and Ted. Do you know Tom Cruise, Tony? All right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're really thrilled to have, have Dr. Fauci here. He's a friend and a terrific advocate for everything we're doing, and, and he'll give us um, his... I'm going to say something. Um, and, and, and before I stop talking, <laughs> I'm stop talking, my friend Dr. Diefenbach, my friend Dr. Diefenbach is going to be going to say something right now. Okay. Dr. Diefenbach has his own speech. So yeah, exactly. Little did I know. Yeah. So the whole point of this is, is that it's unscripted. <laughs> Except you know what it's about. So from the perspective of NIAID, we could not have done what we needed to do and accomplish what we needed to do against coronavirus disease without the HIV networks. All of you in this room made contributions. We appreciate everything that was done by uh, the PTN and as part of the CoVPN. And it's really important that we acknowledge this. So we have a certificate that says National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, award of recognition presented to the HIV Prevention Trials Network for extraordinary contribution to NIAID's COVID response June 7th, Anthony S. Fauci. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give Tony the opportunity for a hug. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, and we talked about this yesterday, and I think that Carl is, uh, really has been my, our great partner on who you'll I'll introduce later this morning. But um, the, the network did work tirelessly on COVID, both vaccines and on monoclonal antibodies. And, and I think the, the certificate that you've just awarded us is really meaningful to us for all the work that was done. So thank you so much, Carl, Tony, and the NIH. OK, so back to Top Gun Maverick, uh, where I left off. Um, <laughs> Tony's presentation is always the highlight of the, one of the highlights of this meeting. So, Tony, why don't we just give you the podium? Thank you very much, uh, Mike, and, th and, and thank you, Wafer, and thank all of you. Um, I appreciate all of the the obvious attention you're giving to me, but I, uh, please know that I realize that I'm just a representative of everything that everybody in this room does. 
And really, when we started the uh, networks decades ago, uh, it was for the intention of getting to where we are now. And the networks and what you've accomplished have really surpassed anything that we would have imagined. So the success is all yours. We appreciate it, but it's, it's got to keep going. This is not the end of the line. I, I just could not help but, but realize you know you're really getting old because in the very first years of HIV in the early 80s, when we were just starting to be recognized, people would come up to me and say, you know, my brother or my wife or my husband wanted to say hello. Now everybody comes up and says, my mother and my grandmother wants to say <laughs> hello. <laughs> I appreciate your mothers and your grandmothers, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little tough. <laughs> okay, so for those of you not familiar with what we've done historically over the years with this introduction is that I'm gonna give you really an update uh, of the progress and priorities of the Institute and not at all limited to just our own important but somewhat narrowed interest of the HPTN. So that the reason I think it's important because you're all part of a much broader process, just the same way as NIAID as an institute that I direct is part of a broader process of uh, addressing these challenges that we have in science, medicine, and public health. So let me just go quickly through this and give you an update of where we are. Uh, some of them personnel updates, some of them actually structural and other updates. So first of all, we know now that we have a really, really good uh, FDA commissioner. Some of you may not be familiar with Rob Califf, but he really is a, is a terrific person. He's originally a clinical trialist from Duke. Some of you may know him from then. Also in the personnel issue, you know that Jeff Zeintz, who was an extraordinary leader of the COVID task force at the White House and the person that I reported to directly in my role as the advisor to President Biden, has now been replaced by Ashish Jha, who some of you know, who is the dean of Brown School of Public Health. He is now the coordinator. You may have heard of ARPA-H, which is a sort of a DARPA-like approach that's gonna be associated with the NIH. We, that will be a presidential appointee, but the acting deputy director, which is not a presidential appointee, has now been named, and that person is there at the NIH. A little bit closer to home to what we do, John Muscola, who is the director of the Vaccine Research Center at the NIAID, an extraordinary individual who many of you knew for his extraordinary work on HIV, but also on other diseases such as malaria and influenza, and now most recently COVID, has left. And the acting director is another person that many of you know is Rick Kaup, who is uh, really one of the top immunologists in the country today, has taken over as the acting director. On a more global front, uh, Tedros, uh, who is an old friend from way back from the time when he was the health minister of Ethiopia, who some of you on the international level probably know, has been re-elected for a second term as the WHO director general. And that's really very good news. Uh, you know, it, it really is because Tedros, who's really a terrific person, has, has been up for a lot of criticism that is not really his fault, if you want to call it that, but has been because of some of the things about WHO, which are really a great organization, but needs to be strengthened a bit. And I think that's one of the things that we're doing. And in fact, some of me, I don't expect you to know this because you're too busy doing important things, but literally the day of the inauguration of President, Obama, of President Biden, he asked me to represent him to officially announce that the United States is rejoining the WHO and our support for the WHO, which as you remember during the Trump administration, he pulled back. So one of the most important and happy things I did was on the first day of the Biden administration, I addressed the World Health Assembly and made the official announcement that the United States is back in WHO, which I think is a very important thing. Okay, so I don't want to trouble you with budget, but I am going to trouble you with budget. Um, so the budget situation is really very complicated for the federal government, particularly now 
and so much money that has been invested appropriately with COVID has put a lot of strain and actually tension uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats about how much money should be given. So we'll take a look at the NIH budget for fiscal 2022, the fiscal year that we are in now that will end on September the 30th and fiscal 2023 will start on October the 1st of 2022. So the budget increase was pretty good. At the NIH, it was 7.5%. For NIAID, it was 4.2%. Now, I wanna show you something so you don't get the wrong impression when you read about it, for those of you who follow budgetary issues, is that the fiscal 2023 president's budget was released on March 28th, just a few months ago of this past year. And when you look at face value of the budget, uh, it looks like a minus number for NIAID, although it's a big increase for NIH to the tune of about 9.3 with the total program preparedness, which is the $12 billion that is for pandemic preparedness, a lot of which will go to NIAID for non-HIV but for COVID. But the minus 0.1% that you see in the yellow highlight is not a real number. Because when they do a budget, the president comes in with a budget based on what the original president's budget was, which was lower than what the real budget was, what the Congress gave us. So that when the next president budget comes, it's based on this. So if it gives you a certain amount, it looks like a decrease when it's actually an increase because the base is different. So when you see this minus 0.1, that's a spurious number it very likely is gonna be higher than that. So I just wanted to make sure we don't get confused about that. Some legislative updates. You know, we've been to a lot of uh, hearings, uh, some of which are appropriations, some of which are oversight. Appropriation hearings are generally friendly. They wanna give money to the NIH. There are obviously the, the, the Republican side of it uses it as an attack on me, but that's become, you know, sort of commonplace. So we don't even worry about that. But the legislative activities was on May uh, 11th, we uh, pre uh, defended the president's budget about the, uh, about the appropriation subcommittee hearing, and that's me together with my colleagues, uh, acting director Larry Tabak, um, who is representing the NIH, and I'm there with some of the other institute directors. A few days later, we did the Senate appropriation subcommittee hearing again, one of the things I wanna point out to you, and this is the thing that I think if there's any message that you take away from my discussion from you today, is that COVID has essentially wiped the, the, the attention to, but not the interest and effort of everything else off the table because it's transformed all of our lives. We all know that. I mean, that's why we're all sitting here wearing masks and essentially upending our lives. But you really need to know that uh, HIV AIDS has not been forgotten. It's not off the table. And as far as I'm concerned, I bring it up at every possible opportunity that I can. And as things start to essentially, you wanna say the new normal, whatever the heck the new normal is gonna be, that HIV is gonna be a very important part of that. So all of our, our goals of ending HIV and the 10 year program, all the things that we're doing with HPTN are gonna continue, and I can guarantee you that I will continue to make that the highest priority. Uh, so you should also pay attention. It's gonna be, uh, I don't know, how much, it's, it's gonna be fun for you to watch, but not fun for me. <laughs> There's a, a congressional hearing that's gonna take place next week on the usual stuff that you're gonna read about in the newspaper. So just as they say, say a prayer for me, right? <laughs> okay. All right, COVID-19 update. Let's take a really quick look at this because this is important. I know it's not HIV, but it indirectly impacts HIV. So where are we now globally? Again, historically, I remember when uh, in the very beginning of the uh, outbreak, um, I had mentioned uh, in a press briefing uh, that this could turn into a really serious global pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in 104 years, and the Trump administration, particularly Mark Meadows, got very, very angry at me for saying that. And I said, you know, we could possibly get to the point of, of a couple of hundred thousand deaths. And, and that put me in the doghouse in the Trump administration for 
the while and now take a look at the numbers with globally a half a billion cases, more than six million deaths and the calculation by modeling, it's very likely closer to 15 million deaths. The cases in the United States, again, officially 85 million, very likely more than that. Uh, also the deaths, now that horrible uh, landmark of one million deaths uh, and counting. We've gone through several waves. If you look at the relative size of the cases of the waves, you see, remember, all of you know, because we've all lived through it together, that at the peak of the wave in the winter, the Omicron wave that started in November, we were averaging between 800,000 and 900,000 cases and about 3,000 cases of deaths per day. Now we're at the point of about 100,000 cases, and when you look at the deaths, despite the fact that we're having 100,000 cases, the deaths are averaging around 300, anywhere from 275 to 300. So the bottom line interesting phenomenon that's going on is that we're getting many, many more cases because unfortunately we have to realize that the vaccines are quite good at preventing people from getting severe disease and death, but not good at all in preventing infection. And we all know that every one of us now wasn't this way a year ago know someone, perhaps ourselves, who've been infected even though we've been vaccinated and perhaps doubly boosted. And that's something that we really have a challenge and maybe some of the lessons that we've learned from the science of HIV will help us to get vaccines that are not only more durable but that also prevent infection and transmission because otherwise the vulnerable will continue to suffer because those who don't make a good immune response are, are not gonna be able to do as well as others. Moving on quickly, remember the arguments that I had with the far right when they were saying, don't worry about children, they don't get infected, when they do, they don't spread, and when they spread, no one gets sick. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Children do get infected, they do get hospitalized, and they do die. There are many, many more deaths among children from COVID than there are from influenza, despite the protestations of those who said that's not the case. It's another example of when the facts and the data come out, all the other nonsense and distortions and, and all the other things just go right down the drain, and you just have to wait and see when the truth comes out. Okay, where are we with the different variants? It's really important. This is a most unusual virus for those of us who have been fascinated with studying HIV. Uh, which is one of the most extraordinary viruses that I think anyone has ever dealt with. It has a partner here with COVID, which is equally fascinating, namely the evolution of variants starting from alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and now Omicron. But Omicron is also continuing to fool us because when you look at the family tree of Omicron, it's way, way out. And the difference between Omicron and Delta was extraordinary. In fact, the transmissibility was multifold different. However, what we're seeing now with the circle is sublineages of Omicron that are progressing, driven very likely by mutational changes through immunological pressure to the fact that we've gone from BA1 to BA2 to BA2.21.21 to BA45. And it's a most extraordinary, I mean, for those of us, and I know many in the room feel that way, are fascinated by viruses, take a look at the time course of variant distribution globally, how Delta came and pushed everything off the map, then Omicron came and pushed Delta right off the map. Fortunately, Omicron didn't have the dual issue of both transmissibility, which it does, as well as pathogenicity, and that's probably due to the inherent uh, lack of increased pathogenicity to also you're now dealing with a population that's either been vaccinated and or infected. So the baseline protection in the population is much better than it was two years ago when there were no vaccines and very few infections. Now, if you look at the United States and Omicron, you could see it came way down. And now that little blip on the far right is where we are now with cases going up and notice it's just beginning to plateau. And going around the room, depending upon where you live, 
whether you live in the Northeast, in New York, Boston, or perhaps the North Midwest in Chicago, is very different than if you live in the southern states where it's still going up or where others is plateauing. This next slide is also fascinating. I really wanted to show it to you. Again, even though it is an HIV, it's the evolution of variants and how they push other variants off the map. So the orange is the original BA 1.1. That's what we originally referred to as Omicron. But then there's Omicron sublineages, and if you look at BA2, which is the lighter shade of purple, pushed BA1 off, and then the darker blue, which is BA2.12.1, which pushed the BA2 off the map. But the thing that we're concerned about now, don't want to increase your anxiety level, but take a look at what's going on in South Africa with BA4.5. Why is that occurring? Why is it pushing BA2 off the map. And that is if you look at a schematic diagram of the ladder of transmissibility, as you go up from alpha, delta, omicron, BA2, et cetera, et cetera, there's a percentage increase in transmissibility which allows for the dominance of that variant. And that's exactly the reason why BA4 and 5 are now dominant in places like South Africa and Portugal, which has more than 70%, whereas in the United States, it went from 0.1% to 1% to now about 13%. So fasten your seatbelts, because BA4 and 5, I think, is going to be the next challenge that we face this summer. So what do we do about these increase in cases quickly? Why is it happening? I already mentioned the increase in transmissibility, the waning immunity that everybody in this room has experienced, including me. I follow. I do the lab core tests like everybody else, and my antibody goes up, and then a month later it comes down a little, and a month later it comes down a little bit more, and then you get boosted, and it goes back up. Also, people, not necessarily in Washington and New York, but throughout the country, there's not a lot of mask wearing going on right now. And we know when that happens in indoor setting, that's where you get transmissibility. We have a toolkit of antivirals, be they monoclonals or direct acting antivirals for non-hospitalized patients. The one that is very popular now, appropriately so, is Paxlovid, which is a direct acting protease inhibitor given for five days for people within the first three to five days of uh, infection, about a 90% diminution in hospitalization risk. However, there's a new phenomenon going on. I'm sure you're all aware of it. You take Paxlovid, you immediately, within a day or so, become asymptomatic and negative. You finish your five days, and a lot of people get rebound in symptoms and test positivity, but they don't get seriously ill. So that's not a reason not to take Paxlovid because it still is very effective in keeping you out of the hospital. In that regard, the Biden administration has launched something called test to treat. It's kind of like mixing up with test and treat that we do with HIV, but means that you go to a specialized center, you can get tested, and immediately if you're positive, you get started on therapy. And there are about 2,200 sites now that are test and treat sites, it's gonna double in the next month. Quickly moving on to COVID-19 vaccines, you're all aware of them. They're now being used in the United States. We have three separate platforms, mRNA, ADNO, and uh, recombinant protein. We have the Moderna and the Pfizer, J&J &J to a lesser extent, but we're now hearing more about others, such as Novavax, which is a soluble protein. Do vaccines work? Contrary to some fringe elements that say they don't work, but they cause more harm, take a look at the number of deaths that are averted literally within a very short period of time between December 2020 and March 2022. Over 2 million deaths, 17 million hospitalizations, 66 million infections, and about close to a trillion dollars in healthcare costs that were saved. That's the good news. The sobering news is that as a country, 
We only have about 67% of the total population vaccinated, and those who are fully vaccinated, only half of them have received their third shot boost. So if there's anything that you can do out there with your constituencies, your patients, your clinics, is to really encourage the ones who've been unvaccinated to get vaccinated and those who are vaccinated to please get the boost. Because it is true that Omicron is a three vaccine virus, not a two vaccine virus. So you are not fully vaccinated if you only have a primary vaccination against Omicron. That's not an official thing that's said, but it is true that two doses don't do very well with Omicron. In the next couple of days, finally, we're going to hear about vaccinations in kids. On June 14th, Moderna's coming in with their EUA request for all their children from six years of age to 17. The next day, it's going to be an EUA request for children, and the VRPAC will meet on that six months through five for Pfizer, six months through four. All right, getting back to boosters, what about booster shots? No doubt that immunity wanes. We don't even need to argue about that. All you need to look at the data for multiple cohorts. Boosters really do help against severe disease, hospitalization, and deaths. And I could give you 50 slides of data, but I'll summarize it just with this slide that if you compare unvaccinated people 18 years of age and older, they have a five times increased risk of hospitalization compared to a vaccinated person with a boost. And unvaccinated people 12 and older have a 17-fold increased risk of dying compared to a person with a primary series and a boost. For that, the FDA expanded with Pfizer booster doses for children five through 11. So that's the first boost. What about the second COVID shot boost? Again, getting back to waning immunity, the first booster restores the waning vaccine effectiveness, including against severe disease. We know that. I could have shown you 20 slides. However, even the effectiveness of the first boost wanes. That is just a characteristic of coronaviruses. It's not like measles, it's not like polio. When you get infected, the, the immunity wanes, and that's the reason why everybody in this room, me included, we get coronavirus infections every couple of years, and it's the same virus that hasn't changed much. It's a fact of coronaviruses. We gotta live with it. However, we can make vaccines that are even better than natural infection, the same way we gotta do with HIV. Remember that, we gotta get a vaccine that's better than natural infection. So now there's growing evidence that the second boost actually helps. And this is a chart that just shows you that we're not boosting kids because we don't even have a vaccine for zero to four. Five to 11 boosting, as I mentioned, but Pfizer is the third boost, not the fourth boost yet. And when you go from 12 to 50 plus, the green checks our eligibility for boosters, even including the fourth boost for people who are either immunocompromised and young or greater than 50. So with a lot of struggle, I, I pushed very hard for this. Anybody that's 50 years of age or older or has an underlying condition, get your fourth boost, please. Now, again, there's a clinical trial going on right now looking at what the best fourth dose boost is gonna be. That's COVID, but what about the next pandemic? We have a pandemic preparedness plan. And again, a lot of the things, and you all know that, that we called upon our networks, our HIV networks, was kind of like you know, the posse that came and rescued uh, from the attacks that we needed to have networks to do the trial. The pandemic preparedness plan is gonna be really important part of that. Now, the plan includes what's called a prototype pathogen approach that was originally conceptualized by Barney Graham at the VRC, many of you know Barney, and that is to study the families of viruses and determine commonalities among them. Immune correlates, animal models, platforms to be used, et cetera. Also, we have an antiviral program for pandemics. 
Some of you may not know, but Karl Diefenbach is the point person in that APP, which is using his experience and our collective experience in developing drugs for HIV. And that's where HIV is really helping the COVID effort. The antiviral program for pandemics to develop and discover new medicines to combat COVID-19. And in fact, just recently we announced close to $600 million for nine antiviral drug discovery centers or AVIDs, which are gonna be looking at and trying to target coronaviruses and other pandemic potential viruses. Some viruses of which you don't remember or maybe you do remember from an earlier part in your career like par par paramyxoviruses and bunya and toga and picarna and flavi. I cannot talk about monkeypox because here again, you know, the incredible interconnectivity of what we all do. And monkeypox, we now know, is a growing problem. It's certainly being undercounted, but the last count as of a couple of days ago, so today is the, what, the seventh? So yesterday, there were over 1,000 confirmed cases in 32 countries. The United States has 27 cases, very likely a much greater number than that. We don't know how much greater. But in your clinics, we've got to look out for this because yet again, another assault on the gay community because the overwhelming majority, it's not, quote, yet, although some uh, RNA fragments were seen in semen in a single person, it's not classically sexually transmitted, but it's close bodily contact transmitting, the kind that you see under certain circumstances, and the overwhelming majority is among men who have sex with men. We have treatments. It's not a deadly disease. The mortality is very low. It's about 1% in the West African clade. We now have drugs that we've developed, such as T-pox, which is a direct antiviral. Brin Sadafavir, not necessarily as good. A very small study showed that it has some activity. And then we have vaccines, such as the Bavaria Nordic Gineos, which is a replication deficient MR, uh, M MVA. All right, what are we doing for uh, research? I mentioned developing currently available countermeasures. The funding is not bad. We have about $20 million, and we're doing an awful lot. I don't want to go through all of this for you for lack of time, but there's a lot of activity going on with monkeypox research, including a planned randomized controlled trial of T-pox in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which Cliff Lane and his colleagues is pioneering. Now, just quickly, an HIV AIDS update. I don't need to do that with you guys. This is what your, your life is. You live and breathe that. But just a couple of important points I want to bring out just for recognition of it, not that you don't already know it. Very pleased that our colleague John Akegasong is now the new US Global AIDS Coordinator. And I'm very pleased that we finally got that post uh, filled because it's a very, very important post, as you well know, near and dear to my heart. The number of advances, I showed this slide many times, but where are we with prevention? Again, I think the salient thing among many is the promise of long-acting PrEP, including directly involving antivirals. And the real success story, somewhat under the radar screen, but it did not go unnoticed by our community, is the success for long-acting injectable cabotegravir, which was shown to be superior to daily oral, uh, 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 oral drugs that we have been using for such a long period of time, Travada. Now, what about broadly neutralizing antibodies? And again, here's where the work with HIV has helped us in our work with COVID, but is really very important. The very important uh, uh, showing that FDA approved the first injectable treatment for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, the daily pill of cabotegravir. With neutralizing antibodies, again, the rather substantial marriage between the two disciplines, where there were two randomized trials of neutralizing antibodies, the famous AMP study. People who don't understand the study think that AMP wasn't a necessarily a success story. 
It was a real success story because it provided the proof of concept that broadly neutralizing antibody prophylaxis can be effective if you have a virus that's sensitive to the antibody, which you all are aware more than anybody else. And congratulations to this group for being involved in this that if we get combinations of antibodies, we very likely can come a long way both for prevention as well as for treatment. And getting to treatment, long-acting antiretrovirals are again an important success story that might replace daily pills. Broadly neutralizing antibodies, just gonna say a word about that. I'm not gonna talk about eradication. We don't have enough time. But there have been a number of studies. Michelle Nutzenzweig has led some of those showing about prolonged viral suppression with anti-HIV antibody therapy, particularly when you have long-acting antibodies in our own lab, we are also pursuing that. Uh, Taeyuk Chung and our colleagues in which there's a combination of antibodies that provide virological suppression. And as I mentioned, eradication, you all know that. Vaccine development very quickly. It has been a challenge, we all know that. Carl and I wrote an article uh, literally a couple of years ago when the, when the lack of success in some of the African studies, and we meant it when we said we must steadfastly move forward to address the critical research gaps, and perhaps, and I think we can, borrow from the successes of what we saw with COVID and try and apply the mRNA vaccine technology. It's not gonna be guaranteed we're gonna get there, but I think it's an important step in the right direction. Anyway, I've spoken a little bit longer than I thought I would, but I thought I would give you kind of a potpourri of what we're doing. We'll close by saying that the scientific advances that people make in the lab have to be implemented, and that's where you all come in, is the implementation of the extraordinary science that's been done. So I'll stop there and hand it back to you, Mike. Let's this year give Tony a standing ovation for all his work. Uh, I don't know if this is. Uh, Tony, I think you're going to stay for a panel, so I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll let, introduce the famous, Dr. Diefenbach is anxious to get on stage, so please, uh, <laughs> so Carl Diefenbach, I think, is known and beloved to this group as uh, the, the director of DAIDS and uh, our leader and partner for now a very long time. Um, his team is here as well. I hope they all have a chance to meet our group. Carl is going to moderate a, 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 a session with Tony and others, uh, so Carl, take over. Thank you, Mike. I just want to reflect on one point that Dr. Fauci uh, commented on, and that was the success of 083 and 084. I think we should applaud you for accomplishing those studies, <laughs> as well as AMP during the pandemic. So um, we're going to move to a session on uh, HIV prevention research priorities, uh, primarily focusing on global AIDS. Uh, we do have um, a local talent with us today, uh, Clover Barnes, who's going to represent. And so if Clover would come up and sit down. So what I have is short biographies that I'm going to read about our, our different speakers. And then we're going to uh, go with some questions and try to wrap this up like 10 after 10. Mike Waffa, do you think? Yeah. Okay. So, um, even though Dr. Fauci has just spoken, I'm going to. The Dr. Fauci is the director of NIAID uh, at the NIH, and he oversees a very extensive research portfolio of infectious and immune-mediated diseases. He's been the long-term chief of the Laboratory of Immunoregulation and has made several co seminal contributions in basic and clinical research, and is one of the most cited biomedical scientists. He is here for a variety of reasons today, not just for COVID, but also he was one of the principal architects of PEPFAR, a plan that has saved millions of lives around the globe. The next person I'd like to introduce um, is Clover Barnes, is the Senior Deputy Director of HIV AIDS, uh, Hepatitis and STDs at, and TB uh, Administration 
at HASTA at, uh, for the Department of Health in Washington, D.C. She is a nurse executive with more than 20 years of combined experience in healthcare and public health. Ms. Barnes has served in many healthcare uh, administration nursing positions, including staff charge nurse, clinic coordinator, a nursing manager, ambulatory manager, and chief operating officer. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her be part of our meeting. And Clover, um, on a personal note, is a major part of our efforts in Washington, D.C. to help us end the HIV epidemic in the city. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce um, Ambassador uh, Kanangasong. Uh, John is the coordinator for, for uh, PEPFAR and the Special Representative of Global Health Diplomacy. Um, uh, Dr. Kanangasong was previously director of the African Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, a specialized technical institution of the African Union. As the PEPFAR coordinator, um, the ambassador uh, will oversee the implementation of PEPFAR um, and the world's largest commitment of any nation uh, to combat a single disease in history, as well as the U.S. government engagement on uh, in fighting AIDS. Uh, there he is. Uh, he has joined us by uh, by screen. Dr. Kanengasong um, is recognized as one of the one of Time Magazine's hundred most influential people and by uh, 50 Fortune Magazine's great leaders. Bloomberg um, also recognized him for the, the same uh, as, a, as an influential leader. Uh, uh, Meg Doherty is uh, joining us from WHO. Hi, Meg. Um, uh, um, and is the director of the Department of Global HIV, Hepatitis, and Sexually Transmitted Infection Programs, also known as HHS, but not our HHS. Uh, at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Appointed on February 1st, 2020, uh, Dr. Doherty um, was previously the coordinator of treatment and care at WHO at headquarters since 2012. She has more than 25 years experience in working in HIV and infectious diseases, including WHO's normative programmatic um, work focusing on expanding HIV treatment in all uh, and reducing um, inequities um, in access. What I'd like to do now is ask a broad question and ask each of the panelists, starting with the ones in the room and then moving uh, to John and Meg, uh, to, to say a few words um, about, um, as you look at where we are today in HIV prevention, and from your, from your perspective, what do you see as the top priority that you would need in order to truly make advances and at the same time, what do you see as the single greatest challenge we see we are facing to end um, the pandemic? I'll start with Dr. Fauci and then go to Clover. Well, thank you, Carl. Um, well, certainly I, there are a lot of a lot of challenges that we face with HIV prevention, but one of the ones that, in my mind, sticks out, and I'm sure there are different versions of that, is to assure the accessibility. Of, of, of testing access to care and access to treatment uh, essentially on a global level. Both here in the United States, you know, we have sort of a microcosm of what the global problem is, and globally we'll hear a lot more from Meg and from, and from John, but from the United States, if you look at the map and you look at the challenge that we have, we have a situation where we have sections and regions of the country where there is a phenomenal disparity in access to all the things that are important for prevention and for treatment. One is access to testing. The other is the prevailing stigma in certain regions, in fact, throughout the country, but very intensively in certain regions where men who have sex with men, injection drug users, and others, A, don't have the access to, and particularly among minority populations in the southern states, where if you happen to be somebody in the middle of a city with access to testing, to care, to treatment, that's a very different situation. So one of the big challenges that I see in the United States, and like I mentioned, I'll lead the global one to others who are more involved on the global level, is the lack of equity that we have. And that's been something that I believe we really need to overcome if we're gonna make any headway into meeting the goal of ending this epidemic in the prescribed time 10 years from 2020. 
it's 2022, and you know we have to get down to 75% decrease by halfway through, and we really haven't budged. Don't get fooled by the numbers of a decrease in cases by 17%. That's almost certainly a lack of access to testing as opposed to an improvement in prevention and treatment. So I'll stop there and back to you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to agree with Dr. Fauci on the equity issue. I think injectable PrEP is going to be a game changer for us. However, getting it to the populations who need it most is going to be the biggest challenge. Who's going to pay for it? How are they going to get to the labs? Uh, there's a lot of mistrust and stigma in the community amongst people who need these interventions the most. And then how do we break that down? How do we get them into the places? I think the things that we've done have worked to a certain extent, but they've plateaued. And the people who want to get into service and can easily access services are, but the people who we really need to get to who aren't accessing services for whatever reason, you know, aren't coming through the methods that we have. Thank you. Um, let's go to um, Ambassador. Thank you, Th thank you, Carl. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, can we can hear you perfectly. Oh, wonderful! So, um, really exciting to be a part of this conversation, and it's very uh, historic that this is my last day at the Africa CDC and the African Union. So tomorrow I catch a flight to Washington and to have uh, marked this transition with this session is truly historic for me and I truly appreciate that I was invited to share a few reflections. So let me uh, very uh, upfront hasten to say that whatever I'm going to say doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the direction that um, I will be leading PEPFA to, but just a distant reflection based on where I sit and watching the pandemic uh, on the continent of Africa and have been away from HIV AIDS for the last uh, close to five and, a half, five and a half years. But there are four things in direct response to your uh, question, Carl. One is uh, we really need to stay focused on where the virus is and remember that the enemy is the virus, period, and use data to at least know where this virus is uh, spreading, how it's spreading, and as we try to achieve that goal of 2030, which is to end the, the, the pandemic. To do that, there are at least four things I, I would like to think we have to begin to reflect on, and it's truly a reflection. And in the coming weeks, I'll truly, after doing a stress test of what the current situation with PEPFA is, I'll begin to lay out a direction. So first is behavior. I mean, what is our behavior uh, uh, how do we address behavior issues? I think uh, others, Tony and others have talked about stigmatization, uh, also community ownership and leadership. How do we reinforce that? Uh, especially uh, we give them the drive, put them on the driver's seat so that they can really guide us as to their understanding of how these behaviors are in fact up impacting the community response. Second is innovation. How do we innovate ourselves into the space of delivery, delivery of uh, testing uptake, delivery of even the new drugs that were alluded to earlier, the long-acting PrEP and treatments, that we have to be very, very innovative. And if we are not innovative, we may end up with products that are on our hands to, to fight the pandemic, but then we go into the value of death where we truly do not reach the intended population. Thirdly, is uh, to be mindful of the disruption, the lessons we've learned from COVID. Uh, and Tony gave a, a very an excellent lecture there about um, uh, the, what COVID has done. We've learned tremendous lessons from COVID, how it can impact HIV uh, uh, delivery systems, but also how HIV delivery systems can be used if were uh, um, intended to fight COVID and other uh, hasten to add that to other pandemics there. So I think uh, this is the moment to take a, a step back and look at the platforms that uh, PEPFA has put in place over the close to 19 years and ask ourselves the question, how do we build on those, those platforms for more greater efficiency so that it begin to protect the investments that we've all put into HIV AIDS over the last um, couple of years. Uh, we've seen how uh, the HIV platforms have been used to increase vaccination of COVID. We've also seen how uh, those same platforms that include surveillance, workforce 
supply chain management, community engagement, and data analysis can actually be used in fighting effectively the COVID uh, and other pandemics. Lastly, sustainability. How do we sustain our efforts? And that means political sustainability. There is not only financial sustainability. I would like to underline that and bold that. Uh, we also look at partnerships, effective partnerships that engage the private sector as well as foundations and others so that uh, we bring all the assets that are required at this critical junction to sustain the fight against the HIV prevention. So let me just end there and again conclude by saying that these are very uh, uh, remarks or reflections sitting from uh, very far from the, the core of this conversation. In, we're sitting in Addis Ababa and reflecting and seeing how the continent has reacted to COVID and what the current dynamics is with respect to the response to HIV AIDS. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Doherty. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, very good, very good. I didn't hear you for a moment there. But thank you very much for inviting me. And I think from sitting at the WHO, everything I've heard coming before me resonates very clearly. But we also need to think about what is the public health approach for prevention, for treatment, for access to care. And not only do we align with what uh, uh, John Nkengasan was saying about sustainability, we also have to ensure that we're looking for whatever global guidance we can give so that can become accessible and, uh, and achievable at, at the country level. What I would say is we're coming out of the World Health Assembly where we note that there are so many other agendas, health agendas, and keeping HIV, STIs, hepatitis, now monkeypox on the agenda has been difficult. And I, so I think what we also need to be thinking about as we move forward for the priority is how do we maintain that rele relevance and maintain the high level of science. Currently, we know that we're almost having eight countries reaching those 90, 90, 90 targets, one at 95, 95, 95. But I think the devil is in the details, as we heard before. There are pockets of poverty, we might say. There are, we know that HIV is being transmitted now primarily through key populations. So the services that need to be delivered have to reach the people most in need. We're very excited about the long-acting cabotegravir. But we're also excited that R&D continues and that those research priorities are maintained. We think having the same regimen for treatment, for prevention, uh, and for PET, for example, could pro cause, cause us some problems down the road. We've just transitioned 26 million people from uh, an NNRTI-based regimen to dolutegravir. And we may want to use, again, at, at large scale, another integrase inhibitor. We have to watch for, for drug resistance and perhaps put on high on our priority some of the smaller molecules like the lenacaprovir and maybe revive, we hope, the ilsatrovir. When we think about key populations and stigma, I think those are gonna be incredibly important that we keep on the agenda. Also men, oftentimes we think mostly about young women, but what are we doing about keeping our men in that cycle of care? For the longer term, WHO and others are really very excited about the mRNA vaccines, what we have learned from COVID to see how we can have actually a, a neutralizing uh, antibody response, we hope, in the future. And we know that the cure continues to push forward. But anytime any of those new innovations come, to the table, we have to think about what the access price would be, how we can share that with countries. Some of the biggest challenges, I think, is we often don't think about the populations left behind, just children, pregnant women, men, as I was saying before, key populations. The stigma and discrimination are part of that, but I think it also is about HPTN doing research around pregnant women, making sure that the, the drugs that are coming online can be used at any time for women and prioritizing perhaps the low hanging fruit for attaining our SDG goals. If we think we have eight years to get to the ending AIDS as a public health problem by 2030, I think the one um, area where we can really make great strides is 
ending AIDS in children. And so if we're thinking about the drugs, the BNAMs, the approaches for postnatal prophylaxis for children, I think this is something we should strive to finish and to show that we've been able to manage to end part of the HIV infection in a certain population. Um, but with that, I, I agree with all of the other issues that have been brought up. And, and it's really not so much about the what so much, but how to deliver, how to deliver these innovations at a cost that is accessible to those who are probably most in need, like the key populations and those who are most vulnerable. So thank you very much. So one of the themes that all of our four panelists uh, hit on was this issue of stigma, dealing with um, key populations, and how to approach and alter the behavior and improve access through enhanced behavior for reducing stigma. One of the tools that we think about for reducing stigma um, is the notion of status te uh, neutral testing. I would like each of you to address this idea of status neutral testing and how you see this as a positive and also what you see as the structural barriers for implementing status neutral testing as we move forward because this is a challenge um, domestically as well as potentially internationally. So we'll do the same order again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carl. Obviously a very important question, and I think that the whole issue of status-neutral testing and status-neutral care in clinic is, is an absolutely essential component of increasing the efficiency of our engagement with the community, but also a very important tool in eliminating stigma. Because if you just drop back a few yards and think about it, to have a situation where you have resources that has a clinic for those who are testing to see if they're positive versus those who are positive to see if in fact they need to get therapy or get their drug renewed, it just doesn't make any sense because right away, you are almost inadvertently creating a two-class stigmatized system by doing that, not to mention the economy of scale to having a clinic, which is a one-stop shop where you go in, and if you are uh, someone who's at risk but has not yet been infected, you get put on the appropriate regimen for pre-exposure prophylaxis, whatever that is, be that Travada or injectable or monoclonal antibody, and if you are living with HIV, you make sure that you get on medication and that you stay on medication. It just doesn't make any sense in my mind to have a continuation of a system that worked originally, because we were in the very early parts of trying to understand this, to right now essentially combining them and saying that it is all one situation and all one process of the healthcare delivery system. So again, it's important for economy of scale, but it's also important to eliminate stigma, for sure. So, easy said. Thank you. Clover, as a front line, literally on the ground, what do you see as the structural barriers to, uh, as we go forward with status neutral testing? So we've implemented several status neutral, neutral programs um, to do just what Dr. Fauci was talking about, to eliminate those barriers and that stigma, you go through this door, you're positive, you go through this door, you're negative, and people not wanting to deal with either of the doors. The real sh issue for us, though, is in the implementation with the funding. So we get lots and lots of money from Ryan White, which sets up great infrastructure and great programs, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we don't get that same level of funding on the prevention side, and none of those funds can be used for mm -hmm. folks who are HIV negative. Mm -hmm. And so you set up really great programs where people are welcome and they're happy to go and visit, but they can only go if they're in this situation. And so if you put the same intense resources around the prevention, you could perhaps stop the seroconversion of folks sooner and keep them from becoming HIV positive. We've done some work in blending funding, local funding, other uh, CDC funding, with our Ryan White funding to try to create a more comprehensive program but the reporting is a nightmare and there's really severe scrutiny from the funders when they come to visit about which patient was paid with which funding and how did you separate it, which is also a burden on our providers who are trying to do this good work and help the people who need the most help in the best way that they can. 
So we need to do some work around how we fund these programs and how those structures are set up so that those of us that are closest to the ground can implement the programs in the best way to get the best and safest care to the people who need it most. Ambassador Kanegasong, thoughts on? Thank you. We, I think, point would be that to acknowledge the, the significant progress we've made in um, testing over the years, but also recognizing the significant and remarkable challenges that still are ahead. I think we touched on this uh, during the first round of uh, discussion about the inequities and inequalities there. To address this, I think it must evolve, I believe, and embrace the status neutral testing. But do that in two ways. One is really to embrace innovation and to admit that uh, we need to learn a lot from the communities that we strive to, to serve. And then secondly, as others have said, and I fully agree with that, is the, the need for integration. Integrate services so that uh, the decrease stigmatization. I think what emerged, in my view, very clearly during the first series of uh, uh, discussions was the issue of stigmatization. How do you minimize that? And I think we, until we begin to integrate services there, I think those uh, issues will continue to pose a barrier in the way that we approach uh, the statute neutral test. Thank you. Paul, can I just make one other comment? Sure. You know, John, what, what, what uh, I was thinking about when you were saying, uh, when you were saying that. Put your microphone on. Sorry. So I think a classic example of a version of status neutral testing is what PEPFAR has evolved and what you're going to have the opportunity to really implement is that the infrastructure that was built in PEPFAR goes well beyond HIV where you can have people coming in and get tested for cervical cancer. You get people get tested for um, breast cancer and a variety of other things that have utilized the extraordinary um, uh, effort and resources that have been put into PEPFAR, and PEPFAR has become a force multiplier where it not only is for HIV, but it is also a situation where people can be essentially accessed for other diseases. So it, it's sort of like a different version of a, of a test neutral. It's more or less of a force multiplier of PEPFAR. So you're going to have an opportunity to do that in your new role, which was actually one of the original intents of it, was not just to be very local in the sense of one particular area, but to expand to other areas of health. So go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, uh, Tony, I can uh, agree more. That is um, really the, the embracing the concept of what do we do in an integrated manner to solve uh, to do more with less and to do more with what the platforms that have been established over the last uh, close to two decades. I fully agree with that. Meg? Yeah, so thank you. From a global level, a normative level, but also how this gets implemented at countries across the globe, I, I don't think we're calling it status neutral, but we're doing exactly the same thing. And I think it's maybe this is a great term that we should be picking up. But if you start to look at the countries and the places in the world where they're starting to really see a decline in new infections, a decline in deaths, they've done exactly what you're saying. They have a full cascade of care that starts from testing and ensuring that everybody gets the services that they need. What we call it is person-centered care so that uh, we, we would offer PrEP, any kind of PrEP, whether it's dupivirine ring, whether it's... Uh, to know for there whether it's long acting that will com be coming on board. Um, PEP for those who are needing it post exposure. And for testing, we've really, through COVID, but even before COVID, looked towards self care and self testing. So the HIV self testing arena has really sparked a COVID self testing, a hep C self testing, and now triple testing for HIV, syphilis, and hep B. So I think all those elements that were brought up about how can you do more for the person when they're engaging with whatever it might be, whether they're at the community, whether they're at a facility. The other area of work that we think is really important is, in, and this is about that, that uh, status neutral um, approach, is really re-engaging people when they fall 
out of the cascade because people will be on treatment for a period of time and then take a break and need to be engaged back into care in a, in a positive way and look for opportunities to maintain that healthy life on treatment or on prep or on event driven prep, whatever it may be. And I agree with the comorbidities and we've already seen at WHO that we're integrating NCDs into our into our work, mental health, and really looking at what are those sort of barriers, if it's a, about men not getting into care, if it's about key populations, it may not just be about getting um, uh, diabetes testing, it really may be about uh, addressing addiction or addressing um, the places where they get their care. And so that's been part of this the, the documents that we've been putting out. And lastly, I would like to say, when you're looking at structural barriers and you're looking at bottlenecks and you want to be able to deliver well, you have to have good information. And PEPFAR has been great at that, of having person-centered data. And as we go forward, I hope that data like that can be used to improve the quality, reduce stigma, and really help healthcare workers embrace the non-stigmatizing approaching to re-engaging people into care. So those are a few points, but there's a lot of work to be done, and we look forward to looking, working with the other implementers on this. Thank you. So now we're going to take some questions from the audience, but I'd like to do it one lightning round as people are lining up the microphones. My, my final question from at least here is that as we, HIV is constantly forcing evolution, as we've seen also with COVID. We need to continue to evolve and adapt and change. What are the new or different strategic partnerships you see that we need to create to really help us tackle the global pandemic? We'll just go around with a quick answer from the four people again. All right, very, very quickly, Carl. I mean, I think we've seen that with COVID, which is a good example of, in my mind, at least in the United States, the first time that I've seen very intensive, clear-cut collaboration with the various agencies involved. Uh, be it FDA, CDC, NIH, HRSA, ASPR, USAID, to the level that I've never seen it happen before. If we can continue that and let that be something that spills over into our approach with HIV, I think we will be much, much better off and have a lot of value added. It really does work. I think breaking down these barriers between institutions is just something that doesn't make any sense on face value, but when you do break it down, it's amazing the synergy that you get. It isn't additive, it's really synergistic when you do that. So I encourage us all to the best we possibly can at the domestic and the international level, particularly stronger ties with WHO, stronger ties with PEPFAR and the Global Fund and all of the other international organizations. Thanks. I'll just add that I think that uh, us local folks need to be more involved in the implementation science that is happening uh, with the research to make sure those things are happening and reaching our communities who need it most. I think we need to include HBCUs and other ethnically diverse organizations into those activities so that you can get at more of the target populations who aren't exposed to research and the other items as freely as folks at other institutions. And I think that we need to work harder to get more people of color and more women involved in some of the studies so that they're there in the beginning and not the afterthought after the stuff has already been published. Ambassador? Let me just add that, I mean, first of all, acknowledge that I agree with what the two previous speakers have said, uh, but supplement that by uh, just saying that um, enhancing our coordination uh, across the board, the major uh, uh, partners involved, uh, i.e. Global Fund, PEPFAR, WHO, UNAIDS, is going to be critical in a way that we uh, sustain the efforts and work with uh, countries that uh, we support. Uh, I would just hasten to add to that that we should be very deliberate in building the local capacities of the implementing partners. Local capacity of the implementing partners is what is going to sustain uh, the drive at, at a community level. And lastly, uh, my experience also during the COVID pandemic has been that engagement with the private sector, which is not necessarily 
uh, looking for money from the private sector, but bringing innovation from the private sector to address mm. probably her uh, issues, especially uh, the pandemics, is key. Uh, I've learned a lot by working with the private sector in Africa, and we have to mobilize that private sector and bring them to the table. Thank you. Meg? Yeah, I think at the WHO level, and you can look at HIV, you can look at COVID, and now monkeypox, the partnerships have been key because we're only as good as the science out there. And I wanted to take it from, you know, the idea that we need to have some big studies, joint studies, um, rather than one-off small studies. They're very good in the beginning, but at this point, when we want to answer the difficult questions, it's good to have collaboration. When we look at innovation or we look about prevention as well, I always think of the upstream and the downstream. And I think WHO now we're getting much better at working on the upstream, the R&D, the pharma, um, what is happening in the basic science? What are the gaps that are going to be able to fill what we don't have guidance or guidelines on now? And then the downstream, I think the collaboration with regulators with uh, stringent regulatory authorities like FDA and the local regulators are important to bring those innovations in and if we need to have those strong relationships so that things move much more in parallel as opposed to in series. And lastly, I agree with everything that uh, John Kengason said regarding um, local capacity, civil society organizations, and really ensuring that you're listening to what the needs are rather than bringing something that is just the base, a new science, a new tool, but understanding is that tool the one that's needed to, to actually deliver um, the solution that you're looking for. So we, we love collaborating and we need to collaborate. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes for questions from the audience here. So we're gonna start on my right, your left, and then go across the room and back. Uh, Carl Fichtenbaum from Cincinnati. Uh, thanks for organizing the panel. I think what uh, COVID has taught us over the last couple of years is that the world is really a much smaller place and that unfortunately, uh, though many scientists and researchers may want to shy away from politics, politics are paramount to change. If we're going to implement our science and make a difference in the world, we're going to have to speak up to uh, attack the void in which others are speaking up, criticizing many people like Dr. Fauci unnecessarily, and hampering our science. Part of what we suffer from here is we can't get people vaccinated, we can't get people to trust us because we don't have a loud enough voice on the other side empowering people in neighborhoods and in local areas where we bring our science and technology ideas and work in partnership with people. We have to be able to build this and be part of that solution, listening to those communities. That's what our implementation science needs to move in that direction. And we can't shy away from this or we're not gonna be successful in any country. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, uh, Jim Pickett from Chicago. So I wanted to just pick up on the discussion around status neutral. And I, I think that's really exciting, but it still has a frame of HIV. For a lot of people who are negative and on PrEP, they still don't want to be associated with HIV. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what the panelists think about framing it more around sexual health and wellness. Mm -hmm and building off a WHO definition of sexual health includes pleasure. Mm -hmm. And we often don't talk about pleasure, and I'm just wondering if the panelists can speak to how you could incorporate pleasure into your programming for people of whatever status, mm -hmm. and recognizing that um, people with HIV have needs that are well beyond HIV, and uh, sexual health needs go beyond just um, navel to knee, right? It's also about gender affirming hormones, it's about uh, legal support, it's about food and housing. So, but I want to take you back to pleasure and how you might pull in the WHO uh, definition of sexual health and engage people um, to come into for services around the idea of pleasure. Thank you. So Jim, thank you for that. I think you make a really good point. Uh, and I think that is one of the issues with over medicalization 
and I think this is will be important to have conversations with with CDC specifically on this as we as we move forward. So. Thanks, Carl. Mitchell Warren from AVAC, and it's mostly a question, I guess, for, for Tony and John. Uh, Tony is the godfather of PEPFAR and of the clinical trial <laughs> networks. I'm wondering what you see as kind of the optimal interface between the R&D and the implementation science that NIH drives through this fabulous network and how PEPFAR can pick it up and, and do even better in terms of the, the leveraging and partnership between um, R&D and delivery uh, in the U.S. government uh, programs. Yeah, thank you for that question. That is exactly the reason why I showed that last schematic cartoon of the handing the baton from the fundamental basic and clinical research to implementation. I think that the, the very premise of ending the HIV epidemic by 2030, be it at the domestic level or the global level, which would involve both Meg and John, and at the domestic level, which involves all of us, is exactly what you said, namely, uh, essentially natural transition and not a separation so that you don't think of the basic and clinical researches and the implementation. Remember years ago, you probably do, that implementation science was kind of like a stepchild of real science, <laughs> which it really isn't. It, if without implementation science, uh, we're not going to get to the goal that we need to do. So I agree with you completely. Looking forward, we've got to look upon it all as one. And it does have the model a little bit, you know, of, of the neutrality of the clinics. You know, you don't have a clinic for this, a clinic for that. You have the ending the AIDS epidemic effort, and it's multifaceted and hopefully synergistic. So your point is an excellent point. So, so let, let me just um, contribute by saying that uh, there's absolutely uh, a need for continuity and to enforce that interface between uh, the outcomes of, from R&D and the implementation so that it becomes a very seamless uh, process. Uh, I said earlier in my introductory remarks that uh, to be successful, we have to continue to innovate and also uh, uh, innovate in the delivery. So I think that means that being always watchful with respect to the new products that are coming out from the R&D and how they can be deployed uh, to address uh, uh, the HIV AIDS uh, situation uh, in the community to, re to minimize the issues of inequities and inequalities. So clearly the implementation science has to be alive and support our ultimate goal of ending the pandemic by 2030. Thank you. So we have three people at the microphone um, and about three minutes left. So let's go quickly, please. One, two, three. I'm Yoli Villarreal from Houston. Um, I want to thank everyone here for the amazing work you guys are doing. Everyone's mentioned the need of increased accessibility and the lack of access to care, including I heard someone mention behavior change. But in my experience, this research has been historically underfunded. So I want to thank um, the presenters who have talked about that changing in the future. Um, for investigators such as myself working in Texas with underserved populations who have little to no access to services, um, being a participant in a research study is one of the only ways that they get access to care. So how can we, um, investigators such as myself in very antagonistic environments, influence the culture or political climate in such an environment to make an actual impact to the community at large? That's a waffer answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough. Uh, again, um, think globally, act locally. That's a good one. Yes, Linda Gale. Hello. Eve Gebhardt, a very uh, community representative in New York. We have the attention span in New York of about the goldfish, which is about nine seconds. I'll be brief. In 2017, I had shared with Dr. Fauci that I had created a hashtag on Twitter, let science educate lawmakers. I like to say that I'm, I love to see uh, engaged scientists on Twitter. What else could be done to convince lawmakers mm. and politicians? Mm -hmm. Last question or comment? I, uh, I thank didn't. you, everyone. I am Justin Smith from Positive Impact Health 
centers in Atlanta. Um, so Dr. Fauci, as you noted in your comments, we haven't really made meaningful progress in reaching our goals of reducing new HIV diagnoses in terms of the EHE plan. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what's one sort of tactical or strategic change you would want to offer so that we can get back on track. We've lost a lot of ground with COVID. What do we need to do differently moving forward to make sure that we get back on track with EHE in the United States? So the question was, what do we need to do to get back on track for? For EHE efforts in the United States. And, and, and the EHE efforts in the United States. 096. And in the HIV epidemic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what we got to do exactly that. We've got to now reset it. We got to press the reboot button because everybody's gotten so involved in COVID, which is what we should be doing with dealing with a historic pandemic. But we've got to get everybody to realize that we are dealing with twin pandemics now. We're not dealing with one pandemic. And just because another pandemic comes along, that doesn't mean the other one automatically disappeared because it didn't. And that's what I think, you know, however you want to metaphorically talk about it, reboot, repress the button, restart all over again. But we still have eight years left, and maybe we slow down a bit in those first two years, but we have eight years to catch up. So we really can get that goal. And that's the thing that I get very concerned about, is that people cannot focus on two things at the same time. We can do that. Uh, we can do that as infectious diseases people, there's more than one infectious disease. Remember, we are dealing with malaria, we're dealing with tuberculosis, we're dealing with neglected tropical diseases, and we're dealing with COVID and pandemic flu, and we're going to still deal with HIV. It's something we can do. So we shouldn't throw up our hands and say, well, we're so immersed in a challenging pandemic now that we can't do both. We've just got to convince everybody that we can. Can I just add that we have to build the capacity back as well. So the providers in the community have lost the people who were most uh, well versed in what's happening with the communities. They've lost a lot of their intellectual capital. And until you can build back that capacity in health departments and community based providers, we're, we're not going to get back on track until we can do that. I think this is a perfect way to end the session with a dose of reality and a goal for the future. So thank you all for your attention. Okay, we're going to have the next. Let's Again, we really appreciate our, our colleagues being with us globally and, and virtually and here. And now we're going to go to the next session, so everybody prepare for a change of topic. And uh, Melissa... Turner is going to be the moderator of the next session. She needs no introduction, so she will come to the podium. Am I correct? You're taking over? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask all of the panelists for the next session to please come forward. Thank you. We're going to get started moving forward with the next session. No. I don't. Are you there? Yes. Oh. oh. No, I can take the chair. So yeah, okay. there we go. <laughs> well,
I think I'd like to begin. I'd like to begin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session. And we've put together a session that will highlight the communication and messaging strategies that facilitates recruitment and retention in HPTN studies. And we're glad to have you with us. We want to highlight the diversity, creativity, and unique approaches that sites utilize to reach participants. We really want to showcase the work of our uh, community educators, people who are in charge of community engagement at the site level. And we're very excited to bring this panel to you this morning. I am Melissa Turner. And along with Ntando Yola, we co-chair the Community Working Group for the HIV Prevention Trials Network. And we thank you for your attention during today's session. And we're going to jump right in. Uh, and again, we're featuring uh, the people who are often the face of our studies on the local level, who are well known to local communities, who are involved with recruitment and retention of our volunteer participants. But we're going to start off with a representative from our Leadership and Operations Center. And we're, we know that that is the center that's responsible for the network scientific agenda and plays a role in all phases of science generation and protocol development and study implementation and uh, execution of annual meetings, such as what we're experiencing this week. So we're going to start off with Jonathan Lucas, uh, who's going to give us an overview of communication strategies and messaging. And Jonathan Lucas is a stranger to no one here. He is an Associate Director for Community Programs and HPTN Point of Contact at FHI 360. He is a public health educationalist and leader with community engagement experience that spans multiple decades. Uh, he's an incredibly talented uh, a public health uh, expert and uh, quite a gem to the HPTN. I'll turn it over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Melissa, for that. Uh, that's the word I want to leave. You're boosting my ego with that introduction. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, that I'm sitting and representing the communications and the community team at the Leadership and Operations Center. Um, and I'm representing their work. They do a lot of good work um, and are really the driving force behind the campaigns that I'll be speaking about. I'd also like to acknowledge the clinical research site community representatives who direct us in the development of these social marketing campaigns and materials. Um, without them directing us on what things need to look like, what we need to include. I don't think we would be as successful as we are. So when we develop these campaigns, we typically engage uh, individual, well, ind we engage on three levels. There's the individual level, we engage at the local level, and then at the national level. And we make sure that as we are developing these campaigns or we're making these community engagement strategies, that we are engaging communities at all levels of the research process. That's from conceptualization to protocol development to protocol implementation and then information dissemination. We make sure that the community staff, they inform again and direct everything that we do. Um, we come up with these study specific campaigns and because they know their communities best, they're able to tell us what will and will not work. An example of that is we used to just use um, uh, stock images like from Getty photos and they told us no, 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 that is not what we want. And so we actually started doing photo shoots in each of the communities where we're conducting um, studies because folks wanted to see actual people from their communities who represented them much better than those stock photos. And that's no shade to the stock photos. I think some of them are actually quite nice. Um, they also dictate what materials are used for community sensitization, recruitment, retention, and adherence. Um, we develop things like palm cards, uh, PowerPoint, study PowerPoint, stair strip, fact sheets, infographic, educational videos. Um, we distribute, distribute retention tokens and then also um, newsletters. I want to make clear though, no matter what we create, 
none of it means anything without those folks who are on the ground engaging these communities and building rapport and making sure that we have established trust in those communities. That's the only way that our studies are succeeding. So I'd just like to give a shout out to all of the community educators who are in the building and all of those who are virtual that do this work. Oh, I'm done. I'm sorry, Melissa. You know I'm <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for all your guidance uh, to us as we are developing these uh, campaigns locally. We appreciate the centralized support that you provide and the excellence with your experience and your ability to bring to life some of our ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, talking about bringing to life. Our next speaker. Jennifer, J Jessica Yeager is a national and Texas state certified peer recovery support specialist. Uh, she is currently a peer support services supervisor for HPTN 094. And for those that you don't, that may not know, 094 employs a mobile van for outreach linking persons with opioid use disorder to care. And this involves, for those sites that are involved, intensive on the ground, face to face, uh, in the trenches, outreach, education, linkages to some of our most vulnerable citizens. And I'm very impressed with the extraordinary work that has been executed by Jessica Seit and others working on this study using innovative change to create pur purpose in our broken system. And Jessica is well known for stomping out stigma and helping others heal while delivering a message of hope. So we turn it over to you, Jessica, to share with us some of your outreach and community education efforts at your site. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I would like to say just what an honor to follow um, an amazing panel uh, with Dr. Fauci and all of the amazing leaders. Um, secondly, to be standing here as a person in recovery, actively stomping out stigma, and being a representation of people in long-term recovery. So this is amazing. Um, <laughs> We have a um, we have a, a quick video, but I wanted to show you some things. Um, this is our mobile unit in Houston. This is what our van looks like. Not as fancy as some of the other sites nationwide, but uh, this is a sneak peek for some of you that have not seen what one of our mobile units looks like. This is a integrated innovative mobile unit this is where we can screen assess and enroll individuals struggling with OUD, OUD uh, in living with or without HIV so this is amazing groundbreaking individuals can walk up to our unit and get services same day so if you guys would roll the video so the, the process to project Integra is an individual walk up to the mobile unit they will have a COVID-19 screening to make sure our staff and them are safe. Once they have a conversation with the peer navigators, we will see if they're a good fit for our study. We will then give them a warm handoff to the clinical team. They will meet with the coordinator, do an assessment, and then meet with the uh, nurse practitioner. Once we receive the participant, we begin the medical exam portion of the visit. The nurse practitioner first asks the participant to share the details of their medical history and current health concerns. The exam will also help to identify health problems that the participant may not be aware of. Lab samples will be collected to check for HIV, STIs, hepatitis infection, and to test if participants have recently taken opiates or medications for opiate use disorder. Participants will receive all lab results in about a week. If lab results are abnormal, treatment will be given or participants will be referred to a specialist if treatment is not available on the mobile unit. Regardless of the results, participants will receive counseling to encourage reduction of behaviors 
that put their health and lives at risk. At the end of the visit, the nurse practitioner or other clinical staff member will guide the participant to the next available peer navigator so that a risk reduction plan can be developed. All right. <laughs> We wanted to just briefly show you that video so that you can really grasp and, and get a hold and better understanding of what occurs. Now, this is the Houston site. There are four other sites in Project Integra that are doing extraordinary work. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Maybe. All right. <laughs> OK. So in the Houston area, we have several more barriers than other states in this study. Um, we are not only the only red state and the only state in the southern United States, so that creates a lot of different barriers that some of our other sites may not have. Although we have barriers, we are still striving in helping individuals to live a life of long-term recovery. Um, here we highlight Project Integra. We, we had an individual um, that came to us. He was homeless, and he is now striving, uh, living independently, having a job, going to school, singing in church choir, and these are the amazing things that we get to do. We get to help navigate individuals out of active addiction, struggling with wanting to know if they're going to just make it through the next minute or hour or day. Uh, and being able to be the light in the darkness to these individuals is powerful, absolutely powerful. Um, and to be able to do this nationwide, man, oh my goodness, it's so powerful. You, I, as a person in long-term recovery, to be a part of such an amazing nationwide study that's helping save lives, that actually cares about people like me to be better, to be successful, and to strive to reach our full potential, and to do that nationwide is groundbreaking and amazing. Um, some of the few things we do as far as recruitment, in the Houston area, there's a few things listed on the slide, but most importantly, it's building rapport. It's definitely having a, a no judgment zone, stomping down stigma, not judging someone because they're actively uh, using or an active addiction. We like to educate the community and let them know that the disease of addiction is no different than having HIV or um, diabetes or any kind of other illness. There are certain things we need to do to live a life of active recovery and be healthy. And these are things that we're really trying to uh, educate and help throughout our city. Um, one of the major ways we have retention uh, is word of mouth. Individuals knowing that they can have holistic care and wraparound services in one shop for free um, we have a lot of individuals that come um, and seek assistance from us. Also, collaborations with stakeholders and partnerships in the local areas, um, emergency room departments, clinics, um, local recovery agencies, 501Cs. These are all ways we can help advocate and connect and really help people live and not die in our city. So. Um, with that, I'll pass for now. Thank you, Jessica. And I think one of the things that we wanted to communicate and to convey through this panel is there are a number of intangibles involved with the work of community engagement, right? That you are attempting to make a human connection that involves your personal humanity, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, your genuineness and your realness uh, to make those connections. And it's, it's, it's uh, intuitive for many, but it's really important to put it out there. This is a very important, we're giving of ourselves to make these connections and to recruit and retain in research studies. And so moving on, moving on to our next panelist is uh, Daniel Bezerra. 
and Daniel is a community education team coordinator at the Clinical Research Laboratory at the National Institute of Infectious Diseases, Fia Cruz in Rio de Janeiro. Daniel is responsible for planning and executing clinical trials, recruitment and retention, and digital marketing to disseminate scientific knowledge. And uh, Daniel uh, is also working on 091 uh, for the HPTN, and this is our study uh, to prevent HIV acquisition and transmission for transgender women involving peer navigation and gender-affirming medical care and other services. So I'll turn it over to you, Daniel, and thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the opportunity to present the recruitment retention strategy today. And I strongly agree with Jonathan. The success, for, the success of our recruitment retention is our community education team. Uh, we have a, a highly engaged and vibrant community education team uh, composed of for, uh, today four trans women and three gay men. And, and our team has weekly meetings to discuss prior enrollment and retention rates to raise recruitment and retention strategies and to outline plans uh, for the next weeks. The team perform outreach assessments to identify the best place to reach and recruit potential participants, including strategic points where the trans population, in specifically in this study 091, works and meets in nine, cl nine clubs in Paris. Uh, in addition, we have a productive partnership with communities involved in clinical studies. Uh, we have solid partnerships with NGOs and reference centers. What? What? Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, we have solid partnerships with NGOs and reference centers and also hold meetings in collectives where peer educations hold workshops in, with perform, uh, informed and combined preve combination prevention present the studies and invite people to visit our sites. We also combine traditional methods and innovative approach, including digital media strategies to recruit participants, not only in person, but also digitally. And with, in retention uh, is all, always a ch uh, challenging, specifically among the highly vulnerable population that we assess. For us, retention starts at screening by establishing welcoming environments to potential participants, uh, accompanying them during the visit and establishing a uh, connecting with them. The team maintains uh, regular interactions with the participants, especially by WhatsApp and Facebook, the most common social me media in, Bra in Brazil. We also conduct in-person meetings which had been conducting remotely due to the COVID-19, but we, we will now resume to in-person. Uh, the team is always av available to support the study participants using digital interaction to provide information, but also uh, other issues include personal matters. We also provide some gifts when the participants reach a specific goal, for instance, uh, coming to a specific visit. Uh, you can pass the, the, the the slides, please, just to see the, 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 the gifts that we, we are. Oh, the strategic points, that, 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 the other one, please. And these gifts. Uh, we, 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 uh, uh, we use a, a, uh, one strategy to uh, reference, peer reference. Uh, we give some coupons and ask the, our participants to invite her peers, friends, and then we provide not, not gifts just to the participants, come uh, like the peers that brings the persons to our centers. And, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. In, in a pre-COVID world, we used to have uh, tabling here at the annual meeting. Uh, where sites were able to set up their tables and display some of their wares, and your site was always a vibrant and highly popularized place to visit. Uh, so thank you for being here and for sharing uh, those strategies and your approach. Our final uh, panelist uh, comes to us 
as a HPTN 084 protocol team member, community educator at Baylor Uganda Clinical Research Site in Kampala. Working in HIV AIDS prevention for two decades, she has vast experience overseeing community engagement programs, outreach, training on sexual health, adolescent and youth health, and liaising with research investigators and program managers to link them with communities. Uh, her name is CC Sousa, and I'm very pleased to welcome her for the podium. She accepted this invitation late when uh, someone else was not able to travel. We appreciate your grace and your generosity for being here. If you don't know, uh, CC was featured on, I want to say about 10 years ago, on CNN. She has a national profile, international <laughs> profile, and much experience and uh, brings warmth and excellence into her work. And we welcome your presentation and your comments, CC. Hello. Uh, good day to you all, and thank you, Melissa, for those wonderful words. I would like to thank the organizers for allowing Beira Uganda share their experience on recruitment and retention, messaging for HPTN 084 study. At Beira Uganda, we use different integrated strategies for both recruitment and retention. And uh, we have an HIV care program which targets uh, high risk groups, their key population. So we used this and we leveraged it on their social networks and uh, personal contacts to gain and uh, identify and foster collaborations with the community gatekeepers and other stakeholders. Although Baylor Uganda had a cab at the initiation of the HPTN study, we saw it necessary for us to institute a cab, which was specifically going to look at HPTN 08 for study. Given the fact that we are going to have uh, enrolled participants from a high risk group, and these were the key populations and the women at high risk of getting HIV. So we wanted to have a cab which could identify and interact with them and guide us on the way to communicate to this particular community. At the same time, we worked with the cab to develop a, a comprehensive list of potential recruitment platforms and venues, which later we mapped the hotspots to know which areas we are going to go, and we assigned each hotspot with the peers who would help us in sensitizing those different communities. We created recruitment materials and to describe the purpose of the study, which included flip charts and the fact sheets from the HPTN as the, uh, Jonathan has already indicated in his uh, presentation. We worked with them also to get these sheets, the fact sheets and the HPTN to help us communicate and sensitize the communities. We worked with the peers and the community leaders so that we are able to build the respect and trusting relationship with the potential participants and the community members at large. This helped us to fight stigma because some people fear to join studies, especially when they are clinical studies, and also looking at HIV prevention, they feared that they would be taken as people who are already infected. So working with the community members helped to curb on the stigma which would have been with our participants. Next slide, please. Okay. So on retention, we had a pre-COVID era where 
we had a robust patient tracking system. This includes, included the uh, locator information collection from each participant to enable us to know where they live and how we could contact them. We had calendar appointment so that we could not miss on uh, reminding participants. We also had reminder calls, both from the study staff as well as working with the peers who live in the localities where our participants were. We had a toll-free line, 24 hours operational, and the participants would call at any given time to study staff in case they needed to do so. We also had the SMS to our peers to remind them that they need to check on our potential, I mean our participants, so that we keep in close contact with the participants. We addressed myth. At the beginning of the study, we had an incident where a participant thought we are injecting HIV blood because the syringe had a red tape. We communicated to the protocol team. We worked with the club members to go to the communities and this was rectified and we had a green tape wrapped on the syringe instead of a red tape. And this lay anxiety among the participants and among the communities. We also had to give them clear describing procedures, how they are being done, especially collection of blood. They always thought we are taking a lot of blood from them, we are withdrawing a lot. So we used a container, a five litre container, to show them that an adult has five litres in the body. And we showed them what we were withdrawing from them in the specimen sample, so that they compared and they knew, oh, it's not a lot as we thought. So that also helped us to allay their anxiety and the, the participants continue with the study. We also looked at the condom use, the high vaginal procedures, because being a female, they saw the spectrum and they were scared, so we could sit and they demonstrate and describe how these procedures are going to be done so that they don't feel like, oh, this is going to hurt so much. And uh, so they had to understand even before the procedures were done to them. And uh, we also had uh, the long acting because some of them didn't want to use long acting contraception. So we had to explain to them about it. We conducted participants meetings which helped us to discuss and share with them about the study and also their experience. We had appreciation gatherings where they could go and have a time of fun out of the study. We also had milestone gifts from the HPTN. This helped us so much because participants would look forward to reaching that milestone. We worked with the CAB to see how often can we provide these milestones which we received from HPTN. So we had a shed for them and the participants would really make sure that they keep appointments and come to the study so that they could also be part of the appreciation. And this CAB continued to support us. So during COVID, Beira Uganda site never stopped operational. We worked with their ESCO bodies, the National, Uganda National Council of Science and Technology, the IRBs, and uh, we shared our developed guidelines and the OSOPs so that we continue to operate and uh, we didn't interrupt any study visits for all the participants who were scheduled according to the calendar. And uh, we were able to support the staff and the participants we ensured the safety of them during the lockdown, and we provided the PPE, which were free of charge. We provided transport to pick and drop participants, and we ensured that staff was at site to make sure 
that they take care of our participants until they were all done with the procedures and then escorted to go back. And we ensure that we give them reminder calls and also call to find out how did they reach home so that we know that they, they are protected. We also kept on communicating. We provided the internet services and airtime to CAB members and peers to make sure that there is constant communication to know how they are doing, both the CAB members, the peers, as well as the participants. We linked them with the government programs for food support. As you know that there was lockdown and uh, this was a high risk group of uh, participants who could not go to work. So we needed them to stay alive and we had to link them. And with also support from the CAB members, they used their platforms to look for food so that we could do, have them supported within the communities where food was being distributed. We continue with the SMS to find out and also to provide the COVID-19 prevention messages to our peers, the CAB members, we also referred them to where the vaccination centers were so that they could be vaccinated, both the participants, the CAB members, and the peers. And uh, we made sure that we follow participants all the time, calling on them. You know, during lockdown, people were kind of stressed up, depressed, so we could call to find out how we could boost their morale and also help them to listen to what they were going through so that we could support them. I would like lastly to thank all the sponsors, the organizers, Baylor Uganda CRS, the protocol team at HPTN, for all the support you have provided to Baylor Uganda and we thank you all for working with us through this journey of HPTN084. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you all. Thank you all. Appreciate everyone's uh, presentation and your uh, sharing of your experiences and your knowledge. And I know that we're slightly off schedule, but I'm going to take the liberty to, to ask at least one question that I'm going to ask all of you to respond to. And um, I'm interested in knowing your, pers your, your perspective on what are the most critical considerations or some of the most critical considerations that you have to address when developing a community engagement strategy. So we've heard at this meeting already how important it is for our community engagement activities to be well funded, to have reasonable funding so that we can have time, we need time. This is not something that you can do quickly to outreach and educate, that we need time um, and that we uh, need the resources to be able to educate and to carry out our community engagement strategies. But tell us from your perspective what some of the most critical uh, considerations that need to be addressed when developing a community engagement strategy. We'll begin with you um, right here from Houston, Jessica. Community engagement is essential. Just like yesterday, they talked about the ingredients of the pie, right? Uh, there are so many pieces, especially in the Houston area. We are boots on the ground. It is imperative that we have assertive outreach, that we are constantly uh, boots on the ground, getting the information out, letting people know that there are services that are free to them to step into a life of long-term recovery. Also, essentially having partnerships with stakeholders community-wide and statewide. There are essential community organizations that we can partner with immediately because we know not only are we struggling with OUD and those living with HIV, but there are issues such as housing and food and the bare necessities that individuals are needing that are struggling with living with active addiction and those who are walking up to our mobile unit. Also, we have an amazing interest group uh, with HPT and 094 in the Houston area that helps 
also with community engagement. They are, in addition to our mobile unit team and our staff, boots on the ground, also getting the word out and helping us navigate and uh, connect individuals to services. Um, most importantly, um, we have an amazing team and they are very vocal. I think it's so important when we're um, helping individuals struggling with opiate use disorder is that we speak up and we speak out and that we're not quiet and that there is a solution. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, the, mo uh, the most important strategies that we use is mostly the peer education be part of their community. They have to be uh, real peers so they can listen the the issues of the community and share with us and we can try to do something about it. And and other important thing is the net of the support and re referrals, uh, uh, partnerships with NOGs and, and always listening, like, not, not just uh, uh, in day by day, but in when we create the, the strategy and the materials, uh, the language, uh, what the visuals that we like and most uh, reach the population. That for us is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, community engagement, as they have said, is essential for the success of the study. And uh, we look at involving different stakeholders to design strategies to enhance recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. And we also need to understand the communities we are targeting and their needs, their values, how do they communicate, because language is very, very important, and uh, what kind of language we use. So you need to understand them. Then also be part of that community and let them be part of you so that you work together, you own the program together, and you don't impose on them. You work to solve everything together as a team, and they should be your stakeholders as you are their stakeholders. Um, I want to say that I agree with everything that everyone on the panelists said. I think the other thing that I'll add is that we have to make sure that we recognize that the populations we work with and the communities with which we work, I'm so sorry, I'm smashed, it might be muffled. Um, they're not monolithic, and we have to approach them, each community and each population uniquely, taking into account um, their specific culture, um, also their needs. We, we can't expect that there's going to be a one-size-fits-all when we are engaging um, these communities in these very complex studies that we are implementing. Thank you. Thank you all for your excellent presentations and for sharing with us the work that you're doing and the incredible uh, efforts to link recruit and retain volunteers within the HBTN, you can see that it takes an immense amount of involvement, commitment, presence, yes, and including those with lived experiences, being part of the community and letting the community be part of you. Very important, very critical. Let's have another round of applause for our presenters, please. And thank you all for your attention. I think we're gonna move on now with uh, awards. Thank you, everyone. Okay, to move forward, this is um, now, this is a rather 
emotional part of this meeting, an important part of the meeting for us. L let me ask for a show of hands, how many of, of you here knew Dr. Ward Cates? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. So about half of you knew Dr. Cates. So we, we, I'm going to describe, say a few words about Dr. Cates and his life. And we provide an award uh, in his memory every year. So if I get the slides, uh, is that the first slide? Okay, do I, do I control? Uh, do I, uh, the computer, there's no uh, clicker, a clicker. Dr. Fauci stole the clicker. Okay, <laughs> maybe this is the clicker. Ah, I got the clicker, okay. So this, that last thing, that's a picture of Ward Cates, and who is really probably one of the most remarkable human beings you could ever meet. Uh, he was born in Cleveland, Ohio. He was raised in Rye, New York, and he was funny and charming and very athletic. He's a really terrific tennis player, played college tennis, married to his wife Joan, has two daughters, uh, Sarah and Deborah, who are thriving, and four grandchildren. Uh, he was a, a remarkable champion of public health, um, writ large. Um, he worked at the CDC from 74 to 94. He was an enormous leader of, um, in the transition from illegal abortion to abortion leader, and I think wrote 100 papers in two years about the benefits of having uh, legalizing and, and routinizing abortion. And I, I, Lord knows how, he, how he'd feel today, but he was a huge champion of that. He then joined FHI uh, in 1994. He started the network HivNet, and I, I'm trying to remember Carl's role in HivNet. I, it's, you know, we're going back a long way. Zero. It, it, I joined it, in IAD in 92. So, 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 so it Ward, Sten might have been the, Sten was the, was the director of, was the Sten overseer of, correct. oversight of HivNet maybe. And anyway, so Ward started HivNet um, and uh, was just a terrific leader um, and did many, many unbelievable things that are summarized on this slide in this career. Um, so when Ward died at really a fairly young age, <clears throat> which was a tragedy for us all, we decided that we'd give an award that would, uh, um, capitalize on the, on, on the qualities that are on this slide. Commitment and leadership to health as a right, internationally and domestically. Really superb judgment about science and what's important. Terrific mentor with generosity of spirit that was exceptional. Tremendous honesty and loyalty and integrity and courageous and commitment to always try and do what's right. Tremendous compassion and just an advocate for things that I think all of the people in this room would find important. And so we remember Ward with this award, and we gave it to people over the years that you all know, Ken May and who we think, and I think you would agree with me, characterize these qualities. Uh, Ken Mayer, Sten Vermun, Quraysh Abdul Karim, uh, the late James Hakim, our beloved, uh, Tom Fleming, and, and Beatrice Grinstein. Now, this year is a little, I want to remind those in the audience that this is a committee that selects the person. So what do you do when the person doesn't want an award? This is, <laughs> this is the problem we ran into. So the, the person who will receive this award assiduously told me, I please don't ever give me any award. And I said this to the committee, I think we office on the committee, and they said, well, we don't, it, it's really not up to the person to be recognized, you know. So I was, you know, and so I want to apologize if the person's angry with me. It's the committee <laughs> that said, you, you must get this award. And so this year, this really important award goes perhaps with no surprise to our friend and beloved Kathy Henson. Kathy, Kathy's, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy, as you all know, has really been the glue of this network from the very beginning. She was Ward's partner in the development of the network. She's worked for HFI for 35 years, uh, you know, and she's been my great partner for many years and, and uh, just a terrific person. And here's some pictures of her ah. in these various settings. So, Kathy, congratulations Thank and well-deserved. Thank, well you. Deserved Thank you. The network. Now, Mike, you know I am going to kill you, <laughs> for the record. And um, it is a very emotional moment for many of us because Ward meant so much to all of us. Um, so I'll be very brief. One, because we're time, and two, because it is quite an emotional, but quite an honor to receive an award that really means a lot to many of us because Ward meant so much to all of us. 
He was an incredible person. I started in 1999 with Ward, starting the HPTN from day one. So I've seen all of you grow, and you've seen me grow. And we've grown together as a family. But um, I can't stand here today without the love and support from my buddy Ward Cates. And you know, it has been a privilege to work with him and all of you. You've made me a better person because of it, and I'm very blessed. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Congratulations again, Kathy, our beloved Kathy. Uh, thank you for everything. I think we're going to now uh, continue with our program and invite Mark Merzinki to come up, please, and, uh, and also other members of the panel to come up. Thanks, Mark. So greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Marzinki, and I'm the co-director of the HBTN Laboratory Center. And like everyone else in this room, I've learned from Kathy. And I will be efficient in my introductions, because we're going to try to get back on schedule with time. So I'm pleased to welcome you today to our HBTN LC plenary session. We have three exceptional presentations uh, which illustrate the breadth and depth of laboratory-based research within our group. Focus is today will be on molecular epidemiology and HIV phylogenetics, the characterization of HIV infections in the setting of long-acting viral suppression, and first-hand experiences with the identification of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, Omicron variant. As stated in the agenda, we'll field questions for all speakers at the uh, end of this session. So I'd like to first introduce Dr. Kate Grabowski. Dr. Grabowski is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. Her research focuses on the epidemiology, prevention, and control of HIV and sexually transmitted infections in Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of Kate's research uh, is nested within the Rakai Community Control Study, one of the largest and oldest population-based HIV cohorts worldwide. She also serves on the exec executive committee on the Pangaea HIV Consortium and directs the HIV phylogenetics core within our laboratory center. The title of her presentation today is Age in HIV Transmission Insights from Phylogenetic Analysis. We'll turn it over to Kate. Well, thank you to the meeting uh, organizers, especially uh, Mark and Sue, for this wonderful opportunity. It's truly an honor. Um, I'm new to the HPTN and a little nervous sitting in front of all these brilliant minds here, so just bear with me. Um, today, I'm really excited to share uh, some recent work uh, that we've been doing in collaboration with the Rakai Health Sciences Program and the Pangea HIV Consortium looking at the intersections between age, gender, and HIV transmission in sub-Saharan Africa using molecular epidemiological approaches. Can I turn the, sorry, I just need to, did the slides turn or no? Oh, there we go. Um, so from the perspective of susceptibility by almost any metric, the African HIV epidemic is predominantly female, you can see from this map, 
um, male to female HIV incidence ratios at the country level uh, globally. Um, higher ratios here are in red and lower ratios are in green. And the green areas represent areas of higher female HIV incidence. And this map clearly shows that the African HIV epidemic is heavily concentrated among women um, who have most of the new infections, with some exceptions in North Africa. Now, the reasons for this are really um, unclear. Um, there are a number of different uh, factors that are at play. And at the most proximal level, um, it could be due to differences in female susceptibility, differences in male uh, infectivity. It could also be due to sampling biases. We saw a really great presentation yesterday um, for the 071 study that showed that um, uh, men and, and uh, uh, HIV status are um, associated with study participation and follow-up. Um, but it could also be due simply to contact rates, so with men just having more uh, contacts than women. Next slide. So what we know uh, about risk factors for female acquisition mostly comes um, from longitudinal studies. We have an abundance uh, of information on uh, factors that are associated with HIV acquisition among African women, uh, both from studies in the HBTN and longitudinal population-based cohort studies like the Rakai program. Um, and across most of these studies, what we've seen is that younger age has been a very historically strong predictor of risk of HIV acquisition among women. And programs and research efforts have rightfully targeted uh, this subgroup of the population. Um, I think one of the most notable efforts in this space is the DREAMS program, um, sponsored by PEPBAR. We know a lot less about the male partner sources of these female infections, though. We have some data that comes from longitudinal studies of serodiscordant cohabitating couples, but those studies are, are old, and they haven't really been, um, there hasn't been really much in that space since universal HIV treatment access. Um, we also, um, also those studies don't capture transmission that occurs from non-stable partners outside of the household. So there's a gap in information um, that we're learning from those studies. Um, also, we can learn about uh, transmission from self-reported um, uh, data on sexual partners. Um, sometimes this data is referred to as egocentric network data, uh, but that data can be biased. Um, and we know that there's a lot of underreporting of partners, particularly among young women. So we have been using alternative approaches to understand transmission at the population, including transmission that is happening both within stable and non-stable partner networks. And we have specifically been using molecular epidemiology and phylogenetics to characterize sources of HIV transmission by age and gender um, in African settings that have uh, higher female HIV burden. The data that we're collecting has largely been collected with the, um, through the Pangea HIV Consortium. The Pangea network um, includes partners across the African continent, including uh, HPTN studies. It has um, uh, generated um, deep sequence uh, uh, HIV genomes using uh, custom laboratory protocols and Illumina technologies for more than 30,000 people living with HIV. It has also spearheaded the development of analytic pipelines, including HIV Shiver, which is a custom assembly and, um, and a, a alignment program uh, for diverse African genomes, and the PhiloScanner tool, which takes the output from Shiver um, and creates uh, phylogenetic trees in the thousands and hundreds and thousands in some cases, depending on the size of the data set. And then from those uh, trees generates transmission networks where we can identify likely source recipient pairs to look at transmission drivers at a population level. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have been thinking very deeply about the ethics of the work that we do in Pangea. We have um, an entire working group that's dedicated to thinking about ethical issues and includes bioethicists and community members. Um, and we also, um, have published on some of the considerations in this type of research. And so I've included this paper here for your reference. The data that I'll present today largely comes from uh, one of our sites that has contributed the largest amount of data to the consortium. And this is the Rakai Health Sciences Program. 
The Rakai Health Sciences Program has been doing research in equatorial Africa since uh, the onset of the pandemic uh, more than 40 years ago. It's led by uh, Dr. David Sirwata, who is an, uh, an HPTN member here that many of you may know. Um, the Rakai uh, program, the, the kind of mainstay of its research efforts is the Rakai Community uh, Cohort Study. Um, Sorry, this is not working all the time when I press it. Um, so the Rakai Community Cohort Study is a population-based HIV surveillance cohort in South Central Uganda, conducted by the Rakai Health Sciences Program. Uh, it's been ongoing since 1994, and it's worked in a number of different communities over the years. Um, but it's surveyed 28 rural and uh, agrarian and semi-urban trading communities since 1994. And 2011 expanded surveillance to four Lake Victoria fishing communities that have very, very high HIV prevalence, so upwards of 40% among 15 to 49-year-olds. Um, currently, we survey about 20,000 study participants every 1.5 to 2 years. So um, the RCCS in each community, it is preceded by a population census that enumerates everybody in the household, irrespective of whether or not they're a resident and what their age is. And it also collects information on births, deaths, and migrations. And so the really nice thing about this framework is that we can use it to correct for things like sampling biases in our molecular epidemiology studies. After the census, there's a survey where we um, uh, ask uh, um, our uh, eligible participants who are residents in the community all different information about their demographics, uh, their sexual behaviors, their sexual partners in the form of egocentric network data. We link cohabitating couples and we ask information on a, about their utilization of HIV services in the community. So we have extremely rich metadata we can, we can um, merge with our HIV sequence information. We also obtain biospecimens for HIV testing and for molecular epidemiology, and we have a specific consent for our molecular epidemiological studies. And of course, we link our participants to the relevant HIV services. So we have been uh, partnering with uh, the Pangea Consortium since 2011. Uh, we've generated more than um, from, from more than 5,000 participants. We've generated deeply sequenced HIV genomes. Um, this is a, a schematic of our workflow um, that we published in 2019 in Nature Communications, where we outline how we have used the Shiver tool and the Phyla Scanner tool to reconstruct directed um, transmission networks with uncertainty uh, from, uh, from African data. And I do want to mention that the networks that we're generating, and you can see them here on the, on the right-hand side, um, they have these uh, kind of multi-directional arrows, and that indicates that there's a lot of uncertainty in, um, in, in, in how we're reconstructing these networks with the phylogenetic data. There's also uncertainty that's introduced from sampling biases. And so what we've shown in this particular publication is that while these approaches are really useful for understanding aggregate patterns of transmission at a population level, they're very um, bad for just looking at um, whether or not yet yeah, this person transmitted to this person. So um, we've uh, published about how these uh, are really not suitable for uses in, in any kind of uh, nefarious way or for cr criminal proceedings. So now back to the question on hand. Um, so using um, these phylogenetic networks, we've, we've, we've generated more than 400 of them. We've identified nearly 1,000 source recipient pairs. And we've been starting to look at sources of transmission by age and gender. And so on the left here, you have incident female infections, and on the right, you have male infections. On the axis, you have the age of the male and the female sources. And on the y-axis, you have the attributable fraction of transmissions. And what you can see for the female infections is that the large preponderance of transmissions are really being driven by men between the ages of 25 and 35. And in fact, in our cohort, um, more than 50% of transmissions are driven by men between the ages of 28 and 32. Next slide, Mark. Uh, 
Yeah, so this is a really complicated figure, and I just want you to bear with me for a moment here. I, I actually don't have a pointer. Um, so what each of these little lines on these graphs here represent, represent the age profile of a different, uh, of, a, of, a, of the source partners for incident cases of a given age. So if we look at these dark purple lines on the left, what we're looking at are the so age source profiles of, incident, uh, of, of um, male partner sources for incident female infections um, and young adolescent girls and young women. And you can see for young women between the ages of 15 to 16 that their male partner sources um, tend to predominate around the age of 25. And we see kind of this heavy tail um, even out into the late 40s. And so these male partners are much, much older than these young women. Now for contrast, if we look at the yellow lines, these are women who are much older, and these are women in their 40s. And what we see is that, yes, their male partner age uh, shifts, so it's in the 30s, mid 30s, uh, late 30s, um, but it's much young. It's actually much younger than them. So older women are being infected by men that appear to be younger than them. Next slide, Brooke. Now, if we look at this on an aggregate level, what we're looking here at is just the male sources of transmission to women again. Um, on the left panel, you can see the proportion of transmissions that are due to women, are that from, to women from men who are younger or the same age. In the middle panel, from men who are one to five years older. And then in the far right panel, we're looking at age disparate relationships, so five years plus. And among our youngest women, we see that the vast preponderance of transmissions are due to men who are much, much older than these women, but that this relationship completely inverts as women age. And if we start looking at the other end of the age spectrum for women, most women are being infected um, at those ages by men who are actually younger or the same age as them. So while these age disparate partnerships are important for young adolescent girls, they're not as much for older women. Next. Um, so we have uh, actually been able to quantify the previous slide, Mark. We've actually been able to um, uh, quantify the overall proportion of transmissions that are due, if you could go to the previous slide, um, <laughs> that are due to, um, uh, to men. Um, we have found that men um, are substantially more likely to drive transmission uh, than women. Um, we've been linking this up with our HIV viremia data. And Yes, we see um, that HIV viremia is, in fact, uh, much more common in men than women. Here we're looking at the mean geometric uh, viral load among all HIV-positive persons on the left with men in green and women in red. And you can see that young men in particular tend to have very high levels uh, of viremia. Um, but our actual peak transmission isn't occurring where that 20 to 24-year-old male uh, viremia is highest. It's occurring a bit later in the 25 to 35-year-old age range. So it doesn't quite stack up with what we see with our viremia data um, uh, with respect to transmission. So um, for now, we've been, um, Mark, next slide, please. Um, I don't know why the slides aren't, aren't shifting. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, so I've been I've been talking about like that that this is a very static entity um, uh, that this isn't changing, but we know that um, HIV incidence is rapidly declining in Sub-Saharan Africa. We've seen a 43% decline in HIV incidence since 2010, and so we've been starting to ask the questions about whether or not these um, age and gender related transmission dynamics are actually changing. Um, and um, Next slide, please. And what we see in the Rakai community cohort study is the same thing. We're seeing lots of declines in HIV incidence with a scale up of antiretroviral therapy. Next slide, please. Um, so, so we have been looking at HIV incidence rates by age and gender in our cohort. Um, and on the left, you have women, uh, and on the right, you have men. Um, HIV incidence is on the y-axis. And in red, we see HIV incidence patterns in 2001 and green in 2017. You can see these huge declines in HIV incidence among the youngest age groups, uh, in both men and in women. But in older ages, what we're seeing is, is not as much of a, an incidence decline, and in women, almost no incidence decline in these older age groups. Next slide. 
And so if we actually looked at the shifting sources of transmission um, to young women and to older women, um, we also see some uh, very interesting changes. So we've taken our molecular epidemiological data, we've split it up into two calendar periods, um, 2010 to 2013 and 2014 to 2019. In the first two panels, we're looking at female to male transmissions in these two periods, and in the last panels, male to female transmissions in these two periods. And so I'm going to draw your attention to the third panel here, which are male to female transmissions in 2010 to 2013. And you can see the yellow is really concentrated around age 20. Um, for these, uh, for, for, for women. And there's this kind of big vertical blob indicating that women are really being, um, infections in women are really being driven by these age disparate partnerships for the most part. But what we're seeing now is this shift and we're seeing this yellow mass kind of move up along the, the diagonal of this axis and we're seeing a flattening of that vertical blob that you see in that third panel. And what this indicates is that the average age of infection is actually increasing over time and that we're seeing more transmissions that are being driven by same age or younger partnerships. We see the same thing that is happening among men. So our epidemiology is changing. Um, if you can change the next slide. Um, we are also seeing increasingly driven male transmission flows over time. Um, so these uh, bar plots here um, on the right indicate how uh, the transmission flows have changed um, uh, with men um, and the yellow uh, driving uh, much more of our transmission flows uh, on the right-hand side there. Next slide. So I started this talk by arguing that from the perspective of uh, susceptibility, the African epidemic is really predominantly female. Um, but from the perspective of transmission, it's really predominantly male. Next slide. So we have seen here that young, unsuppressed, positive men, uh, particularly between the ages of 25 and 34, are linked uh, disproportionately to many transmission events uh, from our molecular epidemiology data. We have also found that adolescent girls and young women, uh, particularly between the ages of 15 and 24, are infected by men who are many years older than them, um, most of the time by 10 plus years, sometimes more than that. Um, but as women age, we find that this relationship completely inverse, with transmitting partners tending to be the same age or younger. As HIV incidence has declined, we see that the African HIV epidemic is aging. We're seeing HIV incidence um, uh, concentrating in older age groups. We're seeing increasingly male-driven uh, transmission flows. And we're seeing same age or younger partnerships uh, contributing more to transmission in both women and men. And lastly, I hope I've uh, convinced all of you how molecular epidemiology and phylogenetics can really be a very powerful tool for understanding uh, uh, population transmission patterns. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to conclude, um, and thank you all for your time and attention. All right, so thank you very much, Kate, for that masterful presentation, given some of the uh, IT challenges. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the next speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Eshelman. Uh, Dr. Eshelman is a professor of pathology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and is the PI of the HBTN Laboratory Center. Uh, she's also the director of our HBTN LC Virology Corps, and obviously she has been involved in many, many of the trials that uh, have been presented over the years, including serving as the virologist for several current trials. Her research program includes basic translational and clinical research related to HIV prevention, and the title of Sue's talk today is HIV Infections in the Setting of Long-Acting Early Viral Suppression, the Levi Syndrome. Let's turn it over to Sue. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this um, information with you, some um, of what we've learned from HPTN um, 083 and 084. So for many decades, we've all uh, become comfortable with a, uh, an understanding of what acute and early HIV infection look like. And here is a classic slide, which you know, could have been from years and years ago. But typically, you think of acute infection as being accompanied by an acute illness with certain symptomatology. 
but mostly notable with high, sometimes extraordinarily high RNA levels very, very early in infection within the first week or two. Um, and also paralleled, because the RNA is in the virus, high levels of antigen on the circulating virus. And then those drop down fairly quickly, within a couple weeks, as soon as the body realizes that the infection is there and responds by producing anti-HIV antibodies. And this drives the level of circulating virus down, and the RNA usually achieves a steady state. This is because of the extraordinarily high levels of RNA and antigen early in infection. These infections are usually um, not difficult uh, to, uh, to detect using different laboratory tools. But what I'm going to talk to you about is some of what we've learned from looking at early um, infections in the setting of long-acting injectable cabotegravir um, when it's used for PrEP. And this has um, uh, my, uh, you know, a partner in crime and colleague, uh, Rafi, um, and I uh, think this really um, deserves uh, its own name, and um, we refer to this as long-acting early viral inhibition, or the Levi syndrome. So just to remind everybody uh, quickly, the HPTN 083 and 084 trials were randomized clinical trials that compared the efficacy of CAB-LA, long-acting cabotegravir, to daily oral TDF-FTC for HIV prevention. And you can see the enrollment numbers and populations listed here for each trial. Both trials were unblinded in 2020 because CAB-LA was shown to be superior to oral TDF-FTC for HIV prevention. And in December 2021, the US FDA approved CAB-LA for prevention of HIV sexual transmission under the brand name of Apertude. This is a very, very brief overview of just the most key points of the cabotegravir arm in both trials. Everybody was screened for HIV infection within 14 days of enrollment, um, provided informed consent. The first step of the studies required um, oral uh, uh, cab cabotegravir. This was all blinded, but um, for every day for five weeks. The oral phase um, followed by um, one injection a month later, and then injections every two months for about three years. If people finished that entire course, uh, they then had um, or were provided with oral daily oral uh, TDF-FTC to cover the cab t the tail or the period after injections end when the levels of the drug um, wane, and they received uh, placebos uh, during this period. So everybody was tested for HIV at study sites at every study visit. They had to have a negative RNA test within 14 days prior to enrollment. And then in 083, they had one or two HIV rapid tests and an instrumented, what we call fourth gen or antigen antibody test. If any of those tests were reactive, all the test results were referred to a clinical committee, um, which then advised them how to use locally available RNA or antibody tests to confirm infection. And in selected cases, samples were sent in real time to Johns Hopkins uh, for an ultra-sensitive DNA assay. All the samples came to the HPTN Lab Center, and we used an extended panel of assays to do um, retrospective testing, which turned out to be quite extensive, using the panel of assays shown here, which do include at the bottom a single copy RNA test, uh, and that was performed um, in Lou Halvis's lab at the University of Pittsburgh. And I should mention that the DNA assay that was performed uh, in this trial was in Debbie Prasad's lab. So um, th we saw several uh, cases uh, that we've published um, the data on of incident cases, and some of these were cases in people who had no CAB exposure in the past six months. And um, in these studies, the purple area shows the period of oral cabotegravir. The orange area shows cab period of CAB injections. If it's slashed, the injections were delayed. And then people might have gone on to receive Truvada afterwards, which is shown in blue, or had a period with no PrEP, shown in white. And you see the first HIV positive visit with the little green symbol at the end, and the first time the site detected the possibility of infection with the little red asterisks at the end. And in these cases where there was no recent CAB exposure, the study sites detected HIV infection at the time of the first HIV positive visit in all cases. There was not a problem detecting these infections. But we also had uh, cases, um, either both baseline cases and cases that were incident, where participants did have recent CAB exposure. There were four cases where, despite the RNA screening, participants entered the study and did have HIV infection at the enrollment visit that the site was not aware of. And they went on, uh, three out of the four of those participants went on to receive CAB injections. They all received some CAB um, CAB. Um, exposure. And then we had seven incident infections, three that occurred during the oral phase, 
and four that occur despite on-time um, cab injections. And in all of these 11 cases, detection of the infection, which is shown here at the end of the bar to the right with the little red symbol, which might be hard to see, was delayed um, uh, from the time that we were first able to determine when infection was um, clearly there at, by lab center testing. So I'm going to show you some case studies. In these diagrams that I'll show you, you can see that the, um, there was a four-week oral lead-in period followed by cab injections. Those are shown here by vertical red lines, and we show cab concentrations with little orange circles. And the red line shows the first HIV-positive visit. That's when we concluded that HIV infection was first, uh, we could confirm it. Our main assay for that was a qualitative RNA assay. And then you can see in blue when the site first detected the possibility of infection, not necessarily able to confirm it, but something was reactive and suspicious using rapid um, tests or antigen antibody tests. So that's kind of the schema. So um, two case, I'm going to show you two cases, one from each trial. This is case D2 from HPTN 083. And you can see that the participant started on a oral cab, had four cab injections shown by the green lines, and then was found to be um, retrospectively found to be HIV positive, but the site was not able to detect the possibility of infection for another 14 weeks. And things were so confusing from the local, av locally available tests that this participant actually received post-exposure prophylaxis for a short period because it wasn't clear to the site if the person was or um, was not um, yet infected. And here are the results from the site testing. You can see that the first site re, um, test that came up reactive was at week 41, and the antigen antibody re test was reactive, but the viral load was negative, nothing detected. A sample collected seven days later was found to be positive at an extremely low level using the DNA assay. But it took an entire 26 weeks before the site was able to confirm the infection using locally available tests. And now an antibody test was positive and RNA was detected, but all, even at this point, the RNA level is still very low, only 23. This slide soup shows you on the right the results of retrospective testing done at the lab center. And here, and you can see that the first positive, the true first positive HIV test was actually 14 weeks earlier. And here, the qualitative RNA test was positive, and using the test from John Meller's lab, the viral load was determined to be 6.1 copies per mil, extremely low. And even so, it took 48 weeks, almost a year, at the lab center before we were able to get um, a com positive confirmatory test. In this case, it was an RNA assay using a, you know, any kind of routinely available um, a test. Um, the other thing which was very strange about uh, this, this case, but we have seen it in now in several other cases, is that usually when you have HIV infection, if you uh, become RNA, if you detect RNA, unless you're treated, it stays there and you still see it. It doesn't go away. And if you make HIV antibodies, they stay there. They, they don't go away. But here what you see is not with just one assay, but four different assays, one detecting antigen, one detecting DNA. Um, and, and uh, two antibody tests and a qualitative RNA test, that these antibodies go back and forth from reactive to non-reactive, detected to not detected, positive, uh, negative to indeterminate, and sometimes flip back and forth. And this is very unusual. So this is the, one of the earliest things we noticed that's unusual about these cases. This is a different case from 084, which is we call case A1. And in this case, the, this um, woman was actually found retrospectively to have entered the study with HIV infection that the site was not able to detect. And it took more than six months before the site detected the infection, or the possibility of infection, I should say. And in that time, she received oral cab and five cab injections. These are the site results. The fight site first detected the possibility of infection at week 33 with a reactive antigen antibody test. Seven days later, uh, 20 days later, a sample that was collected had a very, very low result with the DNA assay. But even five months, it took five more months for the site to be able to confirm the infection with a locally available assay, in this case, an RNA test. And the RNA level, as you can see, is still quite low, still only 33. And here are the results next to that from the laboratory center. And you can see in the red box that the qualitative RNA test was positive at the first five visits. Um, so there was no question that this person entered the study with infection. The confirmatory antibody test, which is the genius assay, was never positive in this entire follow-up period in our hands. And here you can see the viral load, which was very low at study enrollment less than 40. 
and then um, rose over the time during the oral cab period to our top uh, level of 6,300. But then as soon as injection started, the RNA dropped, and it didn't just drop low, it dropped so low that for six weeks on six months on cab injections and six months after the last cab injection, the RNA was not even detectable with a single copy RNA assay. So it went completely um, underground. So our conclusion from not these two, these two cases, but all of our cases in aggregate, were that HIV rapid tests and antigen antibody tests often fail to detect HIV infection in the setting of cab LA prep. And that suppression of viral replication and delayed and diminished antibody expression can persist for months following HIV infection, even after infections are discontinued. And that sensitive RNA testing allows for earlier detection of infections in this setting. Um, the um, US FDA a package insert recommends that individuals on Cabalé prep be tested with a sensitive RNA assay prior to initiating the drug and with every subsequent injection and further require use of an assay that's specifically approved or cleared by the FDA for diagnosis of acute or primary infection. And here are the current USC updated CDC um, DHHS guidelines for um, HIV testing in this setting. Uh, which includes performing an RNA assay, the most sensitive one available, before starting CAB with each injection. And then they added also to continue quarterly HIV testing for 12 months after stopping injections. And these are just the two assays that fit the FDA uh, specifications for use in this setting. They're highly sensitive assays specifically approved for diagnosis of acute HIV infection, RNA tests. There is a lot of impact of missing or delaying diagnosis in this setting. Of many of those participants got unnecessary CAB injections after they were actually infected. In many cases, or most, all of these cases, uh, the, the, the ability to start ART was delayed, and these led, in many cases, to emergence of INSTE resistance. And there was also the potential to impact personal health and ongoing HIV transmission when this happens. Um, we did evaluate INSTE resistance, and we continue to in um, the CAB arm of both trials. And in one, in the, one of the OA3 studies uh, that's, the, that's um, the furthest along, we, we wanted to know if you detect infection in this setting earlier using a highly sensitive RNA assay, do you reduce INSTE resistance risk? And we used not only a standard clinical uh, assay performed at Monogram Biosciences for samples with more than 500 copies per mil, but a highly sensitive um, INSTE genotyping assay performed at the University of Pittsburgh uh, in Lou Halvis's group. And in most cases, major INSTE, the, we, this, even this was unusual because the resistance mutations we saw, I thought, before we did this study, I thought they would appear when the virus broke through with a high viral load. That's when you'd first see the resistance, but this was not the case. We first saw the resistance in low viral load samples. In six of seven cases, the viral load was still below 200, 250 copies per mil, and in two cases, below 40 copies per mil. The resistance emerged very early, uh, a median of 38 days from the first HIV-positive visit. And also, the CAB concentrations were quite high. These, the resistance didn't just emerge as the CAB concentrations dropped. We saw it early with the higher concentrations in most cases. And so th we did conclude that um, use of an RNA assay to screen for infections would have detected infections before a major incident resistance mutation was detected in four cases and before additional mutations accumulated in a fifth case, two cases we couldn't evaluate because the, um, we couldn't get genotyping results. The RNA was too low. And so here you see that um, you had uh, seven cases with INSTE resistance in this report, one baseline, two oral phase, four injection phase. And on the left was what happened when you used the methods for site uh, routine testing, rapid tests and antigen antibody tests that were done at the site. In these six cases, they all, um, they, they all had resistance. But if you had used a sensitive RNA test to look for infection at any, every visit, you would have detected infection in all but one of these cases uh, before INSTE resistance emerged. So we concluded that use of a sensitive assay, it will help identify these infections earlier, there's no question. And it may allow for earlier art initiation, which potentially could reduce the risk of INSTE resistance. But you have to use an extremely sensitive RNA assay to do this because the viral loads in these cases are low. Most important, I think, is that you have to put these um, findings in context. This OA3 study enrolled and randomized more than 2,000 people and had more than 3,000 person years of follow-up. And among the 18 infected, we found resistance in seven, 
and only four of those were in participants in the injection phase. Keep in mind the oral phase is now optional. So in the context of this proven high efficacy, Cabalot should not only be considered but embraced in the toolbox for HIV infection in settings we believe where RNA screening is not readily available. We recognize that that will be many, many settings. That should not be a deterrent to um, implementing this important regimen. Um, and finally, I'd like to now, with that as a backdrop, uh, give you some um, hope to show you that we really think this is a different kind of syndrome, these early infections. Uh, and I have a table to contrast um, acute HIV infection on the left with the Levi syndrome on the right. Um, the, it, acute HIV infection is, is a natural phase of HIV infection. The Levi syndrome occurs when long-acting antiretroviral agent is used for PrEP, and the prototype here we have information is CabLA. Um, acute HIV infection, this is a new HIV infection, always, you, Levi, you can either see this if the infection occurs during PrEP, or if you start a cab LA prep in someone who already has acute infection that wasn't detected. Viral replication in acute infection is explosive, but in the Levi syndrome is smoldering. There's a classic constellation of symptoms with acute HIV infection. You can see them here, fever, chills, rash, and other. But when we looked for any kind of symptoms reported, signs or symptoms clinical at all, in Levi there is really nothing consistent, if anything at all. Often no, nothing's reported. Because the viral loads in normal acute HIV infection are so high, DNA levels are high, antigen levels are high, it's not hard to detect infections. With fourth gen assays, with RNA assays, even less sensitive point of care assays, and our blood supply is um, screened using pooled HIV RNA tests. And you can get away with this because the RNA levels are very high. Um, but in Levi, this doesn't work. You really do need a very sensitive RNA assays because RNA levels are usually low or undetectable, same with DNA, and you have really diminished or delayed antibody production. It's very rare for antibody, for re test results to flip-flop in acute infection, but this is common in this setting um, when you have infections in this setting. Acute infection usually lasts one to two weeks. The Levi syndrome can go on for months and months until viral breakthrough, which usually occurs um, if you uh, discontinue injections or um, um, you start treatment. Um, persistence, you rarely have acute infection persisting beyond a week or two, but here this is very common um, until for months, even after the age, viral agent like cab -LA is stopped. Uh, because of the very high levels of RNA in acute infection, it is a major driver of the epidemic. These people are highly um, infectious when the viral load is that high. We think that in the situation of Levi, these people with these infections in cab LA setting are unlikely to transmit the infection to others while their viral loads are very, very low, except possibly in the setting of blood transfusion should they donate um, and possibly not be aware that they're um, infected. Um, and drug resistance is uncommon in acute infection unless you get un infected with a transmitted strain, but it can emerge um, often in Levi um, even when the viral load is very low. So this is just food for thought, and as we learn more about these infections, as we continue to analyze infections from both trials, um, we can, we'll come back with updates. But um, I'd like to thank um, everybody here, the team, participants, labs, collaborators, investigators, and note that some, some of these data are published and other work is um, ongoing. But thank you very, very much. <laughs>
His presentation today will focus on, uh, on that work entitled Rapid Detection and Expansion of the Omicron Variant in Southern Africa. Dr. Moyo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to share our work, and, and thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity and the privilege to, to join this meeting uh, and discuss this topic. Uh, I represent a number of people that have contributed in this area, and, and, and having grown uh, through the Fogarty program as an HIV scholar very early on in 2000, and learned a lot of work in HIV, some of the work that has enabled us to be able to do this work. So I'm grateful for the network, for the networks I belong to, uh, all the networks, HPTN, ACTG, and IMPACT, and involved in a lot of protocols, uh, including uh, protocol development. Um, this is, um, see this works. This is the outline of, of my work uh, that I'll share today, uh, some of the snippets of uh, what went into the genomics uh, program that we implemented in Botswana and, and with colleagues in Southern Africa that leads to the identification of the Omicron. Uh, this is uh, in this group uh, after the eloquent um, uh, talks by uh, Tony Fauci and, and, and my colleagues, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted. Uh, the role of pathogen genomics in public health is very, very critical. Uh, as you have seen my colleagues looking at uh, characterization of uh, HIV incident cases. Uh, and so we are using these tools to be able to understand, that, uh, to make decisions for public health and making action. So it's not just sequencing for the sake of, of the larval virology, but we need to be able to inform, identify the causative agents, uh, develop diagnostics, and, and also uh, understand the origin and timing of introductions. That also helps us to characterize uh, the, the infections, and, and that may inform the levels of programming that may be required, as you saw uh, data from Rakai. And also, of course, uh, we are interested in, in, in understanding the, the, the viral evolution. As you can see, that uh, Omicron has been massively evolving over time. And with the impacts, of course, in terms of transmissibility, uh, the, the changing uh, immune landscape, and of course, the impact of diagnostics, uh, and also how it impacts uh, the therapeutics. We've also been using it to understand uh, the, the phylodynamics, the movement of the, of, of the virus and the geographical spread, spread uh, and also to track any uh, zoonotic infections. And, and recently, people have been using uh, these tools to monitor uh, environmental and wastewater as an indicator. So implementing uh, a pathogen genomics uh, has so many components that are critical for public health decision uh, and in involves a, a wide spectrum of people from, uh, from public health uh, monitoring uh, and uh, making sure that you have representative, quality assured, timely uh, data that can be linked to public health response. So there's a lot of thinking in terms of implementing a genomic surveillance program that, that we've done. And of course, strengthening laboratory workforce, uh, as we saw in Africa with the rapid uh, uh, sequencing that over the past two years and the amount of investment that went into these uh, um, uh, structures was very, very massive and with so much efforts from Africa CDC and, and a lot of uh, work coming from Southern Africa, especially with the strong leadership from South Africa. Uh, these are the guidelines that have been developed. Uh, we use these guidelines, they are very, very important. Uh, this one from WHO is an important one. Uh, it also focuses on SARS-CoV-2, but is applicable to other pathogens. Uh, it provides uh, some, some technical guidelines uh, of, 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 for sequencing, uh, which is very critical. And also you see this one from the Africa CDC. Uh, it's very unique. It provides uh, also guidance on sampling strategy, uh, and, and, and also on data analysis and reporting. Uh, we've been using these tools, um, and you see the impact of, of how uh, um, implementing sequencing networks in Africa. Right early on from 2020, with very, very few labs, less than seven labs in Africa, being able to generate sequences for SARS-CoV-2 with as little as 5,200 sequences uh, to 2021 with a, uh, almost more than uh, 12 times to 60,000. 
And today, as we speak, we've generated with many, many labs in Africa more than 100,000 sequences of SARS-CoV-2 that are contributing globally to the understanding uh, of, 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 of this epidemic uh, with so many uh, efforts from uh, WHO, from Africa CDC, and the, the colleagues that I've listed below there. Uh, this was done through uh, leveraging on the work that was really designed for other pathogens, and including HIV, uh, establishing sequencing networks uh, with referral of samples from countries that were not able to do their own sequencing and being able to build that capacity with the result of uh, uh, reducing turnaround times for sequencing uh, to almost uh, uh, 14 days. And, and in some of the settings, the, set, this, the turnaround time for sequencing has even reduced to less than a week. So it allows you to really monitor what is going on uh, in near real time. Uh, this has been a very impressive work of uh, so many uh, countries, and, and many countries are now implementing their own capacity uh, to, 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 to sequence. As you can see with seven labs between 2020 and 2021, uh, to, to so many labs implementing their own capacity or re, uh, uh, referral uh, in 2021, 2022, and really the target from 31 uh, countries being able to do their own uh, sequencing in Africa to about 55 uh, yeah, in the coming year or two, uh, massive investment. Uh, and we document some of our experiences in these two publications. Uh, you can read out uh, how we have scaled up and the lessons we have learned uh, that are going to help us even in other uh, 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 pathogens. This is an interesting story that uh, is the main uh, of this presentation is how we were able to position ourselves with uh, uh, identification of Omicron in Botswana and in Southern Africa. Uh, in Botswana, we implemented uh, a pathogen sequencing platform that targeted the entire country network using the network that was built for HIV in terms of referral of specimens. We established a genomic uh, uh, sequencing center at the Botswana Harvard HIV Reference Lab and we're receiving specimens from all labs, private labs, uh, public health labs, on a routine basis using the same sample referral network that was strengthened, established during HIV. So there was a unique uh, day of the 11th of November uh, where specimens were collected in one of the labs referred to us for sequencing in Greater Haburoni. Uh, and as you can see in our floor, uh, they were sequenced the following week, the 15th and the 19th. And when, during our analysis of the sequences, we observed that they were, they were sitting uniquely in their own cluster in a phylogenetic tree. So one of the things that we are doing on a daily basis is to observe the patterns, uh, to analyze the patterns of the sequences as they come out, as we analyze them. We are looking for many questions. Uh, is there any introduction? Is there anything different? Are there new mutations that we are observing? We look at specific genomic regions, and of course, uh, we, we collaborate uh, by comparing these sequences with other sequences in the network. So these four sequences were very, very unique. Out of the 99 sequences that we generated that particular week, these four were very, very unique. They were sitting in their own cluster, and we went back to the lab, you know, uh, in, in viral phylogenetics, we want to confirm that there are no artifacts of sequencing error. So we're able to identify that, no, this, these were very unique patterns. And we immediately informed our, our Department of Health. And I still keep that email. And we wrote an unusual lineage. So we, we, when we said an unusual lineage, we needed help to access this network. Uh, they, they quickly identified, linked uh, these individuals, and it happened that two of them were actually a couple, and the, our phylogenetic analysis confirmed that the distance between these two sequences were actually demonstrating that um, uh, is possibly a new introduction. Uh, with that confidence, we released our data to the GSAID uh, uh, after that weekend, uh, we generated that data. We released it and we compared with sequences all over the world and we realized that they were very unique. The closest uh, sequences there was, was a lineage uh, B.1.203, uh, but de definitely the, the pattern of mutations there was really outstanding and we could not believe that such a virus could actually replicate, uh, but we let the sequences go. Within a few hours, uh, our colleagues in South Africa were actually also uh, puzzled by 
patterns of mutations that they saw in, 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 in six cases uh, within the same time. And because we are in a network, uh, we discussed and we realized that possibly uh, new sequences and also with the travel history of the individuals that we had, we had confirmed that there was possibly an introduction of a new lineage. We described this work uh, in this nature paper that has recently been published, how we identified uh, the Omicron and we allowed the data to be released. Uh, and when we released the data, uh, of course, there were so many uh, negative uh, uh, tweets and negative publicity out there. Uh, the Botswana Ninja virus, uh, the South African variant, uh, and that caused quite a lot of uh, issues around uh, travel uh, uh, that was uh, uncalled for. So this is the, the timelines uh, of what happened that it became very important. Uh, uh, an alert from one of the labs in South Africa around the 15th uh, using an assay uh, that detects uh, the S gene. When they looked at that, the S, there was an S gene target failure. It was an indication that something uh, could be happening within the population. So we had sequenced, of course, within the same week and made our sequence available. South Africans also made their sequence available. And on the 23rd, uh, these 10 sequences that were available. And uh, WHO uh, had a meeting uh, on the 24th and because of the pattern of mutations that were observed and they inferred that this could potentially be uh, a, a variant of concern, very unprecedented classification of a variant of concern within a few days. Uh, uh, and thanks for those who had a foresight to really uh, stem it out. So this alert went out and on the 26th of November, it was designated as now we know it as the Omicron. By then you can see that there was already a, an an increase in positivity rate, both in South Africa and Botswana, uh, across the different uh, uh, regions, highlighting uh, that we Omicron. And we could track through, uh, we increased our frequency of sampling to two to three days uh, apart, and we could track that there was an increasing proportion of the Omicron uh, in, in, in our population of, of this variant. Uh, and we, we also analyzed the pattern of mutations. As you can see, we're used to looking at less than 10 uh, or so mutations in delta and, and, and in beta. And this one was a standing constellation of mutations with over 32 mutations uh, concentrated. And, and, and we describe the, this, um, uh, as you can see, on the panel C and panel D, uh, looking at the relationship of the earlier patterns of B8.1, B8.2, and B8.3. And recently, uh, if you check out, we have released a preprint where we describe the evolution of BA4 and BA5, uh, uh, also in, in Southern Africa. Uh, so that's the uh, showing the distinct patterns between uh, BA2 and BA3. Uh, and of course, BA4 and BA5 have also their distinct patterns uh, 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 of evolution. Uh, this is the, uh, just to show uh, the, the rapid emergence of the Omicron uh, from that phylogenetic tree and also the phylogeography showing a rapid movement of the virus within um, uh, Botswana and South Africa. Uh, this is the data from Botswana. Uh, initially, uh, you can see uh, uh, in April, dominated by mostly Delta, and a rapid replacement of, 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 um, uh, of beta by delta, uh, followed by the BA.1, uh, BA.2, and now BA.4 and 5 are making uh, over 80% of the current uh, sequences that we are generating uh, as we're analyzing some this morning. Uh, and you can see that uh, we are beginning to have an increase in cases and mostly are driven by BA.4, BA.5, we are lagging behind South Africa by two to three weeks. Uh, so South, South Africa is, is beginning to tail off. Uh, and we, it's likely that also in the next two to three weeks we may tail off. But our positivity rate has really uh, gone up from below 5% in two, three weeks ago. Uh, now we are sitting at about 13 to 15% uh, positivity rate. Uh, and this is, uh, demonstrates um, uh, the, the growth advantage of, of, um, of BA4.5 uh, and BA5 uh, over BA2. And it's likely that uh, this may relate to a pattern of immune evasion uh, rather than in, in intrinsic increased transmissibility. Uh, as we saw that if, if there was a, an exposure of BA.1 in the population, um, 
you see that uh, there was an advantage in terms of the immune landscape when BA.2 came in. In populations where there was no BA.1 and BA.2 and just an introduction of BA.4, there might be a different trajectory of, 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 of infections. And you can see that BA.4 and BA.5, uh, we have also demonstrated that they are having um, a, a, a growth advantage. Uh, uh, this is the pattern of mutations, as you can see. Uh, uh, that we are seeing now, and more li most likely because of waning of immunity against HIV, uh, against uh, um, um, uh, earlier on infection, we can see that there is risk of, 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 of resurgence uh, of these um, uh, infections. Uh, this is, of course, BA.4 and BA.5 are genetically distinct. Uh, there is almost a debate about the origin of these lineages. But if you look at the time to the most common Rinzen's ancestor, you can see that it points out that probably around mid-November and probably uh, uh, did not evolve that much until, until uh, 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 a month or two ago. So it's almost dating to show that it might have emerged at the same time with the original Omicron. Uh, uh, and and, and BA.4 uh, may, 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 may also uh, show uh, some more patterns of evolution. There, there are different mutations, as you can see, that are very important, and I'm hoping uh, time is out, but I'll highlight a few of these mutations. So BA.4 and BA.5, they share a similar spike profile, except that BA.2 uh, has, um, there's a, there, there are additional mutations in BA.4 and BA.5. There's a deletion in position uh, 69, 70 of the spike, and we know this mutation L452 uh, from, from, from Delta, and then a new mutation uh, 486 uh, V. And, and the reversion to wild type in position 493, uh, and we see that uh, 493 in BA.1, BA.2, uh, and, and, and BA.3 uh, uh, being the R in that position. And yet in BA.4 and BA.5, we are reverting to the wild type. Uh, that, is that, is that is very, very important. I'll skip the slide. And of course, we see that uh, BA.4 and BA.5 uh, is an impact on, on, on neutralizing antibody escape. Uh, as you can see, the total escape uh, at site 486 uh, is associated with uh, escape from class 1 uh, and class 2 neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and L452 is associated with escape from broad class 1 and class 3 uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so we know that L452 was present in Delta and Kappa and Epsilon virants, uh, and we can see how it may be uh, increasing uh, virus replication in, in BA.4 and BA.5, uh, and also we can see that uh, some of the lineages uh, that are, um, are circulating around the world, uh, L452 R as in BA.2.12. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, this work was important, but it made us reflect a lot as scientists in terms of how uh, the, the, the travel bans. We see uh, this article uh, uh, sharing the scientists that shared Omicron data uh, should not be punished and let us re reject for it. And the cartoon there, how it was uh, uh, very strange that for the first time you're worried about your safety because of some of the, the calls. And, and, and how the disruptions, the, 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 the economic uh, meltdowns that led to uh, because of the, the discovery of the Omicron. Uh, and it was very interesting to see the presidents come up uh, to the lab and immediately after that followed by uh, a press conference with the CNN and really standing behind us and giving us confidence that we should continue being transparently releasing our data. Because as you know, some people don't release their data into GSAID or public databases because uh, the, of some of the consequences that uh, may be related to that. And so that was important, and we, 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 are, we are humbled by the recognition, both uh, the Time 100, uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Mem uh, Humanitarian Awards, and uh, Professor Tulio named as uh, nature's top 10 scientist. Uh, and that has been humbling, uh, despite uh, the reactions that we, we experience. So in conclusion, uh, establishing a systematic pathogen genomics and surveillance was critical in the identification of the virus. 
So having a systematic uh, surveillance system has helped us. Uh, that is routine, that is able to monitor what is happening and a coordinated approach both in South Africa and Botswana where all labs are network to identify these variants is very, very important. A haphazard approach will not help in identifying early on uh, variants of concern. Uh, and we see that uh, Omicron is now accounting uh, for the majority of the infections globally, it was shown there. Uh, and we see that there's a complex mix of immunity in Southern Africa right now, acquired from uh, wild-type uh, uh, exposure uh, at, uh, from beta, delta, and Omicron, and of course, of the vaccine. So this may shape what we may see coming on. I just want to acknowledge the team that I work with. I'm privileged to work with uh, a lot of uh, talented young people that have grown through the HIV networks and now are contributing uh, to generating data and contributing to the world. Uh, thank you. I acknowledge support from uh, funders, um, uh, from Fogarty, from, from FIND, from Melinda Gates Foundation, from Africa CDC. Uh, we also acknowledge the contributions of the Minister of Health in Botswana in establishing this network. Our colleagues in South Africa that have been very in the forefront, NGSSA, whom I work with on a weekly basis. And of course, in putting up this work, uh, Richard Tulio, wonderful, uh, and, and Sophonias have been very critical in helping me put these slides. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Dr. Morio, for that um, riveting presentation. It looks like we have time for maybe one question, and we do have someone that would like to ask a question, so we'll turn it over to you. Hi, so this is a plea. Uh, this is addressed to Dr. Susan Eshelman. Uh, my name is Steve Innes from Cape Town. Please, can we allow the HIV alias the option of referring a sample for a single copy assay in a situation where we believe that a participant on CAD may be infected. We having, I noticed your data showed extremely long delays in us starting ARVs because of the extremely long delays in being certain of a diagnosis. We have the option, we know that it would have been picked up earlier had we used that option. Please can we ha have that option be made available to the HIV alias? so that uh, we can resolve these cases without waiting six to nine months so before we start I, I think, so thank you very much, it's a very important point. I think in almost all of these cases, use of a routinely available, commercially available, highly sensitive RNA assay, with a, like we're doing in the Olay components of the study, most of these have limit of detection of 20 or 40, will detect the overwhelming majority of these cases. I showed unusual case where the virus was so low, even the single copy RNA was not useful. The single copy RNA assay is not commercially available. It's available in only one laboratory that, you know, does do research. So it's, we can't refer, they can't, they're not available to do real time testing. Um, the testing is retrospective. It takes quite a while to receive the results. So I don't think that's an option. Moreover, as we move into the implementation studies, which for 083 will transition this summer, we'll no longer be sending samples back to the lab center for testing, even the DNA assay, which you know, will be coming out with some information about whether that was or wasn't really how, how, how informative that was. But I think the, um, the, the best we can do for the participants in these studies is what we're doing as soon as we went into the original Olay transition, which is to perform RNA testing at every visit using an assay with a limit of detection at least 60 or lower, and um, we're hoping that um, that will be, uh, will de that should detect the majority of these cases early enough to avert resistance. The real question will be, and we don't have the data yet, we're just beginning to see those data, is how useful this RNA screening is. It's a massive effort and cost to do this type of RNA testing at every visit. It's not feasible or affordable in many, many settings that urgently need interventions like HabLA. Moreover, um, very, uh, you um, run the risk that you'll get false positive results at very low levels, and you may take someone off Cabale who's not infected and who needs it for protection, you know, and put them at risk. So um, I think we're, we're trying to um, understand the recommendations, obviously, from the, from the company based on the data we provided to do this type of testing, but we know it will not be done in all settings, and we don't know yet the, the cost-benefit of even doing RNA testing with commercially available tests. 
So uh, I hope that it helps to answer the question. Those are questions we hope to sort out in the next few months. Even, you know, using the Olay testing with sensitive assays, um, are we detecting more false positive cases? How many true cases are we detecting early, and would that have averted problems like resistance? No, we thank you. We thank you for that that question, and I think that again, it just highlights that it's an, an evolving landscape and evolving conversation. Um, given you know the fact that we are a bit over, and I do have our uh, our co PIs stand, standing on my shoulder, I want to thank uh, all of our presenters today for really just highlighting the cutting edge and impactful research um, that is done and contributed by. Um, laboratory teams across the spectrum of infectious disease. So let's give them another hand. And I will turn it over to Dr. Cohen. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Lunch is outside. Then the afternoon sessions will begin at 2 o'clock or when appropriate to what you need. And we'll see you then t in this room again tomorrow morning at the appropriate time. So thank you all for today. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Yes, yes. I will.